Pardon me. Uh, evening, everyone. Uh, this is John Stefano with You Do It. That's my channel that you're on right now. And we're hosting Friday Night 3D Printer Community Hangout. And that's what the F3D PCH means. And today's topic is 3D printing and how to rapidly uh, create a uh, robot with 3D printing technology. And we have a guest panel tonight. And the guest panel consists of Glenn and Xander of Fun King 3D, Walter of uh, Country 3D, and we have other guests uh, joining us this evening. One is Chuck Hellebuck. He will be late. His uh, he is watching the game right now, the Winnipeg Jets. And so we'll start with introductions, and I'm going to start from my left, and that will be uh, Glenn and Xander. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Riley. I'm Chuck Kellebuck. <laughs> I don't know how he does his intro. I don't know how Chuck does his intro either. I can't remember. But, uh, no, I just, uh, you know, we don't typically get on. We're, uh, we're Glenn and Xander from Fun King 3D, and we don't normally get on in anybody else's shirts but our own. But uh, I just wanted to, uh, mm. I wanted to do a little representing. Chris Riley was nice enough to give us shirts at uh, Murph, and Chuck gave Xander a shirt at Murph. So, uh, we just thought we'd re represent somebody else for tonight, but uh, but uh, not not in any bad ways. So anything I say bad does not go back down on Chris Riley, because <sighs> you know I'm kind of a foul mouth guy. So uh, you are. <laughs> so uh, Xander and I uh, we we run a father and son. Um, well, it used to be just a YouTube channel, and it's kind of expanded. But uh, we're a 3D printing and electronic channel. Uh, we like to do a lot of. Uh, a lot of small projects and uh, are just ramping into some big projects, which uh, we'll talk about later. And um, we're available everywhere, Fun King 3D. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. I don't know, wherever else you can find Fun King 3D. I guess that's it. All right. Thank you, Glenn and Xander. Uh, we're going to head over to. Oh, that's, that's, uh, I'm sorry, John. That's Chris and Chuck. Get it right, John. <laughs> All right. My apologies. So this is Chris and Chuck. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. All right. We're heading over to Walter now. Walter of Country 3D. Tell them who you are. And uh, if you can, showcase that uh, device that you showed off at Murph. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know who y'all talking to, but the real Chris is sitting right here. I'm Chris Riley. I'm in my basement. And I am filming this live. I don't know who that other guy was. But, no. Anyway, I'm Walter, uh, Country 3D. And, you know, he said something about, what, do you want me to show my printer off? Hold on, i got to move my camera. There it is. Can you see that? Yeah, here. They, um, I had a printed printer at Murph, so everybody wants to see it and see how it does. And since since half of my channel is on here this morning or this evening, here, you get to see it early before everybody else does. We did print the Griffin. So we'll talk about it in the morning. But we're on here to talk about robotics. But I'm Walter. I do this a live stream. That that's pretty much it. Uh oh. We lost everything. And now we oh. have a guest co host. Uh can you hear us, uh Ross? Yeah, I can hear you. Can Excellent. You hear you? So Ross is of and go ahead and do your introduction, Ross. Uh, I'm Ross. I uh, run a YouTube channel called Geared On For What. Uh, it's my first time on Google Hangouts. And uh, yeah, so this should be fun. Excellent. Um, so tonight's uh, topic is robotics and 3D printing. And I approached both uh, Chuck and Ross uh, earlier in the week. Um, I think uh, Ross just got done with... Uh, having a lipo selection or something? What, what what was it that you had? I uh, I just had an appendectomy where they where they take your appendix out because it's about to rupture. Oh yeah, appendectomy. It's a little bit different than a lipo selection. Yeah. So I really appreciate you joining. I mean, I, I explained to Ross. I'm like, look, you know, it's inconsiderate of me to ask you, and then I left it at that. And then he's like, no, I, I could join. I could join. <laughs> so it's really cool. I appreciate you being here, brother. Um, and uh, Chuck does robotic stuff also. 
So, um, what do you have any of your things there that you can show us uh, within reach, uh, Ross? Okay, so while Ross uh, grabs that, and if you're talking, Ross, I can't hear you. And if you're yeah. not, that's why. Am I supposed to mute the microphone after I say things? I'm not sure yet. Um, you, you follow that protocol, but if you know you're going to say something, yeah, you can. Because the what happens in Google Hangouts is, as you're talking, the microphone will uh, trigger the software to switch uh, cameras to the person who is talking. Um, so yeah, here I've got uh, the first robotic project that I ever did. And it turned out quite successful, actually. It just uses NEMA 17 stepper motors, uh, 66 to 1 gearboxes, and it's got four axes and a crappy little end effector gripper thing, and it works pretty good, actually. Uh, can you go into a little bit of detail about how you... Th this is your show right now. So go into um, details about how you designed it. Um, and also talk about, um, you, you'll have to talk some about your gearing, uh, with that, that you came up with. Uh, yeah. So I, I designed it in fusion 360. Uh, basically what these uh, gearboxes are is these are, um, compound planetary, uh, gearing mechanisms. So this is something I thought up and I thought I had invented it like, just like the ratcheting CVT, but it turns out I hadn't, uh, Someone else had thought of it before me, actually. NASA patented this technology back in 2002. And it's cool because it doesn't require any hardware. And that was the basis of this whole robot, is to make something that doesn't really require much of any hardware. Um, so I went ahead with that and uh, and designed this thing. And, and yeah, it can actually lift a lot of weight. It's a strong little robot. So... Uh, so the, the gears uh, that you create. Do you have um, do you have one of the planetary gears separate that you can kind of show and give us an appreciation of how the planetary gears work? So he creates some crazy things. Uh, Chuck just joined. Uh, okay. We'll say hi to Chuck. Um, the um, the gears that uh, he creates, he's able to stack them in series and have some significant reductions, which is a multiplying factor, if I'm not mistaken, right, Rose? Uh, that is correct. If you're referring to, like, uh, the ones that I've designed, like the 1,379 to 1. Yes. Uh, I've got a video coming up to where I'll do uh, a gear ratio of 18 octillion to 1, which is, I think there's 10 zeros or, or, or more, uh, maybe, maybe 15 zeros in that number. So that's just insanely high ratio. For a final ratio, but uh, the gearboxes that that robot uses is actually uh, looks like this with uh, the ring gears removed. So uh, basically, what this is is that the first two halves of it, or the first two modules of it, are the same, and everything else is just a repeat of that. So uh, yeah, I guess that's what they consist of. And it's two different planetary gear sets with the planet gears interconnected, and uh, the same number of planets and all that, and I have a program that'll calculate how exactly to design this and how many numbers of teeth to use on each gear. And so that's how you go about that. Yeah, that's really cool stuff. So it's a selfish reason why, well, every stream is that I do, uh, that I chose this topic of robotics. Uh, one was I want to get into this. Uh, we all in the 3D printing community are involved in robotics, whether you consider it or not, because what you essentially built is a robot. It's a robot that's performing a specific task that's commanded through G-Code. Um, one of the things that I want to do is try to replicate what Ross created, and I want to do it all in Fusion 360 using his methodologies so that I can then go the next step and try to see where what what's next. You know, It's like you're doing your first woodworking piece. Okay, I did that. Now let's see what else I can build. Can I build a kitchen table? Can I build cabinetry? So that's, uh, you know, it's like your first Benchy on a 3D printer. Um, before we go to Chuck, um, give us a, a little update here what you're doing, Glenn and Xander. 
Okay, well, real quick, uh, potent pot uh, printables in the uh, in the chat wanted to know about Ross's robot. Is it uh, what runs it? Is it Arduino based? Yes, it is. And then there was something else. I'm sorry. There was something else asking. Oh, a link for your channel. If we can get a link for your channel. Yeah, we got that. Uh, Rover took care of it. Okay, so uh, what Xander is doing right now is actually building a robot. This was a uh, this was a Christmas present that he got this year, and uh, I don't know if you can see that or if it's real glared, but uh, it's actually uh, it's a robot that shoots these little ping pong balls. I don't want to lose any parts. So, please. so and it's um, if you've ever built anything out of out of the uh, the Technics Lego, it uses a lot of those same style little pins, it's kinda like and then. Oh, and then plates. Yeah, no, you can't show it to the detail camera. You have to show it to this one. Uh, a lot of plates with little tiny holes in it. So uh, he did good. He built the, uh, the he built the last one, which was uh, like age range, fourteen to eighteen or something. This one's also fourteen to eighteen, and it's no, 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 no. the last one was uh, younger. Oh, was it? It was like I don't remember. So, but it was a remote control bug, and this one is a ball shooter. And I told him once we get both of them built, we'll figure out how to combine them so it'll be a remote control ball shooter. So, and, and, and Xander was Chuck tonight until Chuck showed up. You see that? He's sure. All right, Love there you shirt. go. That's the lead in there. Glenn and Xander, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Chuck, you're up. Tell us about you, your channel, and then uh, tell us about uh, robotics. Okay, first of all, I got to say Jets won. We're going to second round. And back-to-back -back shutouts. Two shutouts. So dang, and 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 your son was the target of some jokes. He was. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jimmy Fallon. Yeah. So uh, no, great night, great night. Um, so my channel is uh, Film It Friday. I do try to do practical prints, but basically try to help people get started with uh, 3D printing, electronics, a little bit of electronics, and some CNC thrown in there for fun because I love it. And if you want to check it out, filmatfriday.com. That's what the channel's all about. So, uh, now, what do you want to know about? Robotics? Uh, yeah, tell me about your, the, the stuff. I mean, so the preface is we're already performing robotics. Some type of robot build, right? Because we built a 3D printer. Um, but you created a kit. For Chef Club, I think was it open source something? But good, you can talk about it. Yeah, I'm working on it. I'm, it's not still a work in progress. Um, this is the current status of it. Uh, the whole idea was what came about. I, I've built a ton of robots over the years, so let me show that before I go on. Um, so this is one of my favorites. This is a dome bot. I call it. It's got multiple layers. It's got sensors on the bottom for uh, line tracking. It's got obstacle detection. And the sensors are all behind this plastic dome. So it, I could have sensors all the way around this thing. So it could act like a, you know, a Roomba or whatever and drive its way out of wherever it has to. And you can have layers of electronics. Um, simple ones I tried to do. Like just for kids to to learn the basics. This is all tore apart in pieces. And then sumo bots. That's another one that's been popular where you put two of them in a ring. They have light sent their sensors, so they kind of try to knock each other out of the ring, just like a sumo wrestler. So those are those are common robots that I've played with for years. But what brought about this thing was kind of inspired by Daniel Nore, you know, and uh, his whole uh, Open RC. And I thought, okay, we've got Tinkercad. And Tinkercad now has Tinkercad circuits where you can do Arduino. So the electronics is, you know, partially covered. You got Tinkercad can design the plastic parts, parts of the frame, the wheels, um, bracket here for, for scanning back and forth. So this thing can go back and forth like eyes and find its way out of a maze. So I wanted to see if I could take pretty much everything that Tinkercad offers and offer up a design that's completely open source that people could build, download, modify, and, um, you know, make your own little robot. 
this thing is based on for anybody that's it's you know into the tech or the electronics i got uh, continuous rotation servos these are actually parallax continuous rotation servos the frame itself is based a lot on the bobot the parallax bobot if you're familiar with that the electronics i got on here it's an arduino shield right now but i have my own Chipino shield, so if someone wants to use PIC microcontrollers, they can. It's got a uh, battery shield here on top, which is something I designed many years ago. This was a kickstart, successful Kickstarter. So it's basically, it's a 9-volt battery. If you tear apart a 9-volt battery, some of them, they got a bunch of small quad A batteries inside. So what I did is I found quad A batteries and made a shield. This thing plugs right in, so you don't need an external 9-volt battery. And you can stack these up. So if you stack them up, it's like putting 9-volt batteries in parallel. So you can make all kinds of power that you need. But that mainly powers the electronics. And then I got these expansion shields right now. And then I got batteries on the bottom, just some double A's. That's just for the motors because you typically want to run the motors separately than you want to run the electronics. Just connect the grounds. So that's what this is about. And then there's a servo up here that you know controls... Now, this is a normal servo that just goes 90 degrees back and forth for the sensor. I plan to put sensors on the front of this, and that could just be simple switches, like uh, we have stop switches on our 3D printers. could be the same thing. When it bumps into it, it knows to back up. And that's pretty much it, a little roller ball that can go in you know, multiple directions. That's 3D printed. So there's two things I really am looking at doing. One is possibly getting rid of these servo motors and replacing them with DC motors. And behind this, these wheels, I've actually got infrared um, detectors. I use that in, the, if you ever saw my uh, Bender bank that I did a project, we dropped the coin in and Bender talks and says, you know, thank you. That was one of, it was a filament Friday from well, a year and a half ago or something. It's the same sensor. So it can sense whether there's a hole or not a hole. So with that, I can determine how much each wheel turns. So you can accurately go straight so far or turn a certain direction. And that's all then controlled by software. So I'm thinking about changing to a DC geared motor here instead of the servos because you actually have more control with the sensor that way. And then the other thing I want to do is, and this violates kind of that, the whole Tinkercad idea, but is make a custom board combine all this kind of into a single board much simpler that could just be soldered together and control the whole robot instead of all these wires and stuff i mean you still have some wiring but you won't have as many things on here so that's that's the direction i'm heading with it and then from that you pretty much can do anything with this robot you can drive it out of a maze you can um have it you can add line followers to the bottom if you want to do that and you could just control it by, you know, counting how many steps it takes and run any kind of routine. I've even thought about you can put a, a, a little router on the front of this and program it to, you know, run on top of wood and just carve out like a, you know, like a mobile CNC and carve out what you want just over and over again until it cuts through the wood. So there's um, a lot of potentially practical applications, although it's probably not the most most practical way to cut wood but it's it could be fun and and also teach at the same time so that's that's where this came from and this is what the the open source robotics platform i'm, I'm trying to create and then release to the public that's awesome chuck yeah you got a lot of ideas there i know i have a lot to pop into my head but then the problem is, is that i forget them i don't write them down uh, so the camera slider for me was like the first uh, real thing into uh, robotics and using the 3D printing. Um, I do have more plans and I, I want to work with Ross on the next thing and I want to involve kinematics. So if anyone isn't familiar with kinematics, it's the study of motion uh, and you have to take into account a lot of things including the mass and the moment of objects that you're trying to move. Um, because then you can, as if you could uh, hold up your uh, motor again, Ross, and talk about it for a minute so we can see it. You want me to hold up my my motor? Your um, the robot. The robot. Okay. Yeah. 
so I I don't have a whole lot more to say about this, but I was gonna I was gonna chime in on your kinematics thing and that I get I I have a lot to learn from you on that. I actually have uh, no idea what that's all about. So uh, <laughs> that makes it really interesting thinking that I designed this whole thing and I I have no idea what you're referring to still. Yeah. So so you you can keep holding that up just for reference. Everybody can see it in there. Um, the idea of kinematics is understanding that when the motor at the end, the furthest motor away, doesn't have that much force that it has to act upon. The motor that's second in line, the next degree of freedom axes, it has the responsibility of itself, the arm, plus the weight of the motor, and the arm or effector that's attached to that, and then so on and so on. So it's a compound effect. And typically, you'll either use the same size steppers and expect that the stepper at the end is going to have more current because it has more weight to it, or you size things accordingly, or you gear them. Um, and the study of motion gets really serious when you're talking about velocity. And if you remember the uh, parabolic effect of gravity and acceleration and all these things, but then you have to do a lot of integration and differentiation when you're talking about moments. It's it becomes simpler when you can just plug things right into MATLAB. MATLAB does a lot of these things for you and helps you with kinematics. I'll really have to check that out. That would be I'll, uh, I'll have to see. Yeah, we, we can go through it. So I specialized in robotics when I went to Drexel. I attended Drexel University, which is a university in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It is a university that does many things, but one of the things that they do well is electrical engineering. And I specialized in the aspect of robotics, which means nothing more than I took uh, core classes in robotics and the study of motion uh, with robots. And my senior project was uh, involved in a six-legged, 3,000-pound robot donated by GE which was something that they intended on using on uh, Mars, but it was really just a prototype to, to kind of go towards that direction. Uh, so, uh, Chuck, I'd like you to talk a little bit about Tinkercad. So the audience here, I'm going to say that 90% of the people who are here understand 3D printing, understand... Um, design, modeling, all the things that are required for 3D printing. For the other people who do not, go into a short discussion about how you use Tinkercad, uh, the benefits of it, uh, why you're able to do something real easily and make your visions become reality. You can go. Okay. Uh, just real quick, there's a couple, there was a couple comments. Um, about about the robot, there are some servos, continuous rotation servos, with built-in feedback, but there's not a lot of them. Uh, that's actually a relatively new thing. A, a lot of the servos are just reworked 90-degree servos, so it's continuous. Um, and speed control is a little bit harder to do with a servo, where I can actually do speed control with a DC motor, which is actually a DC motor inside of a servo. But anyway, I just want to give that feedback. The other thing someone asked, was it autonomous? And yeah, this is autonomously driven, which means the microcontroller controls everything. There's no external RC, um, like, you know, the RC cars like Daniel Norris. This, this runs on its own code. So how you program it is, is how it runs. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, Tinkercad for me, I mean, I've done a lot of CAD. I have an engineering background, electrical engineer. I've done... You know, design, I worked for Ford for 22 years. There's many things running around in vehicles that I've designed. Um, so I know CAD, and I've done a lot of board layouts, and things like that. What I love about uh, Tinkercad, what really attracted me to Tinkercad was, was two things. One, it's almost like playing with clay for me, which I, I always love playing on a clay wheel. So the idea that I could just kind of play with blocks, almost like when I was a kid, you know, but I could take these blocks and I, I can have a vision of what I want to make. And I don't have to necessarily worry about getting, you know, right dimensions or right angles. I could just put pieces together and shape it almost like clay 
only just with my mouse and a computer and put it into place. And I just found it really worked for me. It was very relaxing. I could just sit and I found I could really create some interesting stuff once I learned how to use the software. And it really didn't take that long. So that's what I tr- I do basically with Tinkercad is I have a vision in my mind of what I want something to look like. And then I just start building it. And if there's something I want to put in that design or on that design, I can either find it in Tinkercad that someone made or I can des- design it myself. Like you can go into Tinkercad and someone's already made an Arduino module. So if you want to build a case around an Arduino module, you can just import that Arduino design that they made and use that to base your design around. So there's no, you don't have to get in there and do a bunch of dimensioning and stuff. You, you can just kind of mold around it. And, and if there's, there's a lot of this, like this whole robot, um, a lot of these parts, the servos, the, the sensor up here, the uh, Arduino itself, the battery pack, all these were already designed in Tinkercad. So what I actually did is I built this robot in Tinkercad, just using the pieces that I had found and then built the frame kind of around it. I did make the wheels. I could, I did find some wheels. I didn't really like them. So I made my own, but at the center of this wheel is a servo horn. It's just the servo disc that, that fits right on the servo splines. That was in Tinkercad. So I brought that in that someone already had done and, and just built the wheel around it. So in the end, I, a lot of this was just virtually built in Tinkercad. And so that's what I like about Tinkercad and, and its simplicity of doing that, but also that I can just create what I have in my head right in front of me. And then I've seen Okay. So Chuck is no longer with us. He's locked up. Can we have confirmation on that? It's not just me. Oh, no. He was totally alien grabbed. (laughs) (laughs) He grabbed? Okay. All right. Very good. So what I want to do is I want to share my screen and bring up. uh, Well, that's all right. We have the other Chuck here. He can continue the discussion. Um, Go ahead. um, (laughs) Nice try. I like Tinker. All right. All right. right. I was for sure he was going to say, so I designed my rocket in Tinkercad. <laughs> so this is, uh, you can still hear me, right? This is, um, can I get a mic check? Thumbs up if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, everything sounds okay, good. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is Chuck's, uh, let's see can you still see that in full screen? I need a uh, audio confirmation, audible confirmation. Yep. Looks good. Okay. So this is uh, Chuck doing this in Tinkercad. So for those who do not know what uh, Tinkercad is, it is a 3d modeling software that allows you to place objects. And what you said, What you heard Chuck talking about was uh, it's like working with clay. So you can throw a block down. You can throw a cylinder down. You can see the toolbar on the uh, right. And then after he's done, he 3D prints the part. Is uh, Chuck back yet? Yeah, I think I'm back. Okay, yeah, I hear you. So let me uh, stop sharing. And we're back to you, Chuck. Okay, I don't know where I got cut off, but... uh... It was like this. (laughs) But what I was trying to explain um, is the idea is that with Tinkercad, you know, kids can get involved, but also it it introduces them to making things with their hands or, but also with a computer. So that next step, when they want to go to Fusion 360 or any CAD program, they already have a concept of, you know, how things fit together. But what one thing I said, I think it was cut off here. I said, I've done a lot of engineering soft, used a lot of engineering software, done a lot of engineering. And I'm to the age now where I just, I want to have fun. And 
Uh, that's what Tinkercad is to me. It's not that I can't use Fusion 360. It's not that I don't want to learn Fusion 360. It's just I have so much fun using Tinkercad. Uh, it's, it's like being a kid again, and that's why I continue to use it on the channel. Uh, that's good stuff. Yeah, I, I always I I love poking fun at, at Chuck just just in jest, just because I'm from Jersey and that's what we do in Jersey. Um, but uh, yeah, I I admire that he sticks with something and uh, sees it through. Uh, for me, I'm like the uh, the rectangle drawy type guy where I just like throwing rectangles and extruding them, and so that's why I use uh, Fusion 360. That's like back to my AutoCAD days. So I, I feel at home in Fusion 360. Um, so um, the thing is, I, I've learned too. I mean, I've done a lot of electronic design, board layouts, you know, really complex stuff. And when you do electronics, there's like any design, there's just hundreds and maybe thousands of pieces that you're working with little tiny components and then the tolerance of the, the components, the resistors and, and how you bias the transistors. And I mean, along before code, I did a lot of stuff before microcontrollers were, you know, all the rage. Um, so when you work with that many pieces, there's so much complexity. And then when you do the board layout and everything else to do something as simple as throwing some blocks together and create something, that's really a, a thrill for me. That's what really got me into 3D printing. I, I wanted to do just make cases for my electronics. But as I got into it, I'm like, you know, I could just go make this bracket for my, uh, you know, hold my tools, the screwdrivers on the end of the bench or make some custom thing. And I'm like, wow, this is really a handy tool. And that's really what launched the channel. I'm like, I got to show, I got to share this with people because no one in my family gives a crap, you know? And, and, uh, so I got I got to share this with somebody, and that's when I launched the channel. You know, there weren't that many channels when I started. I mean, Joel wasn't even he was like six months behind me when this whole thing started. So even though you know I didn't grow, but I was there in the early days and watched all this you know happening. It was so I could share that fun. Like, look, you know, I'm over fifty years old, but I'm like a kid here playing with this thing. And so that's what really catapulted me into the you know, 3d printing was just an extension of the complexity of electronics and everything else so that's why i, I just love the simplicity i don't i just don't really want the complexity that some of the cad stuff will will require i just want to sit and play play with my blocks yeah no that's good stuff uh, there was a comment about any from ken anybody use autodesk inventor so I really don't know what Inventor is. I think we talked about it in one of the F3D PCH live streams. Anybody uh, in the, who's hosting have any experience with Inventor? I'm aware of it. I know some people have used it. Um, some people prefer it over Fusion 360, but Fusion 360 has kind of taken over in many ways. Um, but there are there are some advantages, I guess, to Inventor. I've never personally used it. I've seen some people using it, and those that really love it will mostly stick by it. So, uh, uh, Ross, your your designs in Fusion three hundred and sixty for your gearing uh, are you able to uh, to show us any of that? Because you can share your screen. You can bring up Fusion 360, assuming that your laptop is uh, strong enough for that. Because um, Fusion 360 is pretty intensive. Uh, if you're able to do that and just do a quick run-through of how you design the gearing, things like that. If you could do a quick run-through and how I do a screen capture, I'll give you one. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, screen capture, you, you could just bring up your YouTube video, pause it uh, at a particular point. If you have one where you're showing the design, uh, there's on the, the buttons on the left within Hangouts, um, there's a share screen. If you hit that button, it, it shares your screen to everyone. But if you don't hit the right one, it shares your bank account information, so be Ooh. very careful. <laughs> Wait, really? 
No, I, John, I, not at all. Let me write this number down. <laughs> I can't. Uh, I can't specifically go. I, I can't specifically go to a video where I've shown much Fusion 360 stuff, uh, but I could show you in Fusion 360, I guess, the process of making some stuff. Yeah, th th that that would be cool, I think. You know, spending, like, if you think it's five minutes, 15 minutes, just going through some of that. I'm really, I, for, for me, I understand gearing, but how to do it in Fusion 360, you know, I think if... If nobody wants to see it here, you know they'll they'll let us know in the chat. But I I'm I'm interested in it because I think it's something that would be beneficial to anyone who wants to undergo uh, robotics or some type of motion control by gearing down something. And and the way you 3D print it to accept the shaft of the NEMA 17, the way you were showing me, and uh, you could just literally plug the NEMA 17 right into the uh, the shaft, the main, the primary shaft of the planetary gear, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So how I did that is I actually left, um, I left clearance uh, around. Well, I obviously created the shaft or the hole for the shaft slightly larger than the motor and crossed my fingers, uh, and it happened to fit. Uh, so a lot of that that's just clearance stuff, but. Um, if I wanted to show you some stuff that I'm working on now, I've got this. I'm, I'm trying to build a new robot, like a six-axis robot. And I was just coming up with some ideas on how I can create an end effector to where uh, you could grab this plate, which would have a gripper mounted to it. You could have a bunch of different plates and then electrical contacts in here. And then this would be actuated by a servo. This is actually a newer version of some other stuff I was working on. Um, if I could find that show you guys that. I don't know if you want to take over for a while while I pull this out. Well, I'm just uh, I'm in awe of that uh, drawing that you showed there. That's some advanced uh, Fusion 360 skills, being able to have an assembly. Uh, I, it, it shows me that I have a ways to go in Fusion 360. I'm kind of like just drawing a sketch and extruding stuff, and you're over here making uh, complex objects. I, I was spending way too much time trying to create something that didn't have any hardware in it when in reality I should have just uh, put a bolt in it like because <laughs> that would make a lot more sense but I was taking it too far and it, it didn't pay off. What was that noise? That's me. Sorry about that. <laughs> you freaked me out. <laughs> Give me another chat and I'll pull some stuff. Down here yeah, very cool. All right, so um, we'll let uh, we'll let Ross give us a, a, his cue when he's ready to show us some more. Uh, for me, I want to do my first design in three D uh, design fusion three sixty gearing planetary gears. And I want to be able to hook it up to a stepper motor and have the thing run. And the way I understand it with the planetary gears is the, the main shaft is the center, and the if the the output is the what's around it. Um, and then that's what gets connected to like an arm that you 3D print. And then you can stack those in series to have many degrees of freedom uh, for different things. And one of the one of these robots uh, that uh, I saw was at NAB. Now, I, w I didn't go to NAB, but I saw this on Basic Filmmaker's uh, channel and on Sean Cannell's channel. Uh, he, they both showed, I, I forget who made it, but it's this robot with six degrees of freedom that you can hook up a camera to and you can program it with a, an Xbox controller. Uh, you, you make the motion of wherever it is, and you can sit here on your phone. That's the example they had. They have you're, you're sitting there on your phone, and so the the camera comes in, zooms in, comes around to the top, looks at from behind, comes around the person, looks from behind, and it's all these complex motions that it's impossible for a human to replicate, moving at speeds of like nine meters per second or something. 
Um, so it's, uh, it's we're in uh, the age of robotics is here. It's uh, beneficial in many ways. You know, it's controversial in some ways, and people are losing their jobs because because of it. But I think us as people in the 3D printing industry, uh, whether it's hobby or actually doing this for real, we have an opportunity to do stuff and make some really cool inventions involving 3D printing. Uh, if you're ready, Ross, uh, let me know. And if All you're right. not ready, yeah. you are? Yes, I am. I didn't realize I had my microphone unmuted that whole time. Uh, we didn't notice. <laughs> I don't think. Okay, yeah. so I wanted to show you something that I've been working on. So I, I've been talking to you at uh, Midwest Rep Rep Festival about building a new robot. And this is, relates back to the other thing that I showed you earlier to where I wanted to have this end effector to where uh, you could have a plate and this plate is where your tool mounts and then you have this other part here uh, that your tool mounts into. But here I've actually got, I've went as far as installing, boy, this is slow. <laughs> uh, I went as far as actually coming up with an idea for an electrical connector that I found on DigiKey and uh, putting motors in here and planning to use the typical like compound planetary gearboxes that I have been designing in here. So this is planned to be like the very last joint of the next robot I build. Um, although I, I, I am going to redesign this because it came out uh, so rough. Uh, but it's good to have an idea of what I'm doing at least uh, for something to start with. Um, and if this wasn't all linked up, I could show you actually have it play and how it was made, but it's just going to show you the components popping into place. So right there, that looked like it was your planetary gear that was going in? Yep, and actually what that is is that's a dummy because uh, the, the gear set itself takes up so much power for the computer the to run CPU, it. CPU, yeah. Uh, so once this finishes, I'll pop up a model of the gearbox itself and show you that gearbox moving. Um, so this is uh, the 66.46 to 1 that I showed earlier. And this model, if the computer can do it, I can actually move this model and show it working like it's supposed to. Um, so, yeah, I can hear the fan on my computer just zooming right wide open. So Yeah, you don't realize Fusion 360 is intensive until you do it in a live stream. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, I'm not sure what else I got here. Well, no, that was exciting seeing that. I, I definitely want to learn more about how to do the animation. Now, was that animation, or were you just doing that within the model itself with all these linkages? Uh, that is joints and motion links is what that is. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's all, all manually manipulating it. All right, um, I'd like to uh, take a minute, a, a break from robotics, and we want to talk about the next event that's coming up. Uh, so we all, have, or many of us, attended MRF, uh, which is the Midwest Rep Rep Festival held in Goshen, Indiana, uh, towards the end of March. Uh, it's an awesome festival. Uh, the, the history of it was told to me that it was started in a somebody's garage, and uh, then several meets later, I don't know if it was an annual basis or monthly basis, uh, it just got to the point where it was too big. And so they, they formed in, a, a, you know, a show, a, a festival. And I, I forget how many attendees were last year, uh, but it sounded like it was a record number for the show for this year, uh, where 1,500 tickets were sold. And I, th I think the tickets were free, um, but it's it's really funded by the sponsors. And the reason why it's done like that is so that the the creators uh, of three D printing uh, cost of the ticket is not the hindrance. So you're willing to come there um, to show off your wares and your three D printed stuff. Well, now there's the the problem for some uh, with uh, Murph was that, it, you know, it's in Indiana. For me, 
it was a 12 hour ride uh, for others it's even longer so the idea was to create what's called the east coast rep rat festival or erf e-r-r-f for short and it's going to be held i think in um help me bel air maryland bel air thank you and uh it's it's actually a a arena like i think uh with a huge floor space i mean there's all kind of photos of the floor space and everything and it, it's it's not to show up any other event and like hey we're we're better it's just a a nice laid out event so that we can showcase uh some vendors and uh showcase 3d printing so we'd like to yeah so nick nick confirmed the bel air maryland as uh, glenn did um and the reason why i'm bringing this up is because tickets are for sale now uh you can sign up through east coast if uh, Nick, can you post the link in um, the chat, please? Uh, East Coast Rep Rat Fest, Ville, maybe, dot com. Uh, but we'll get the exact link from Nick. And then, um, let's see, let me handle this right there. Then um, the idea is you have your table your table space and you show off your 3d printed stuff. And many people are geared up for this event by uh, designing huge projects or whatever. Like what I did for Murph was I created a uh, camera slider and um, the camera slider allowed me to um, get experience with a component of 3d printing that I was only aware of from the periphery. I had no actual experience with it and that was using a rep rat board um which was uh, the bq 3d printer board so it was cool stuff gave me a lot of experience with g-code i knew g-code from cnc but i didn't know it from the aspect of 3d printing and being able to read the temperature or send a command to engage the extruder or level the bed things like that Hey John, real quick, uh, Walter's uh, Walter's wanting to do a quick outro so that he can. Uh, yeah, let's do it. You know, grandpas have to go to bed earlier. Yeah, well, he streams like six in the morning or something every morning. So, <laughs> yeah, he's he's got to go. So go ahead, Walter. It's all you. Hey guys, I'm I'm sorry I got to drop out, but um, I do get up early in the morning. We got morning coffee in the morning on Country 3D uh, on YouTube. You can find me there or hit me up at Country 3D on Twitter. Um, Morning, morning chat. We're going to go over a couple models that the guys picked out today. See how they printed one on the printed printer and one on the Mark III. Going to compare the two and see how they turned out uh, using two cheap filaments I got from Amazon. So we'll check those out as well. Um, but y'all come see us. We'll have some coffee in the morning. 8.30. Right, uh, real quick before you go. Okay. Uh, show your printer again and explain <laughs> how that printer is different than other okay. 3D printed printers that are built or sold. All right, I don't, I don't know if I have to keep the volume up, but first I'm going to show, I'm going to put the model up here that printed today. For those guys that are coming in the morning, just close your eyes. But this, this was printed on the printer I'm fixing to show you, and I can't, I don't know if you can see the quality of the print or whatever. I didn't do any, there were no uh, supports up underneath the chin, so I do got a little artifacting underneath there, but nothing major. So now, if you get motion sickness, be careful because I got to pick my camera up. All right, so this printer is well 3d printed the extrusions and pretty much everything on it other than the hard parts is 3d printed um so the entire frame all the parts of course are 3d printed the case and all that and it's basically a, a printed uh mark ii haribo um which mr ryan prior has dubbed the country bow and I have one of the extrusions, if you want to see it down here, that I keep for uh, for just for shiggles, as they like to call them on YouTube. Um, but basically, it's just a printed aluminum extrusion frame, and uh, pretty dang stiff. It prints pretty good. So uh, try to try to do some comparisons with it. 
Um, we're going to do some comparisons over this next week. And then we have some, some excitement after that. So y'all come on over and join. Uh, I live stream most of my stuff because I like you to see me screw up and you can feel my pain. Um, or not. You can laugh at me. Either one. So, but that's it. Uh, sorry I'm having to drop out so early. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, coming on and co-hosting in the beginning. And uh, you're always welcome. Uh, you uh, you were the hit at Murph, man. The printer the printer went worldwide. Yeah, it, it it really did amaze me because I actually expected there to be more of that at Murph because you know the whole rep rap thing. That's what I figured a lot of it would be. Um, I was I was very very shocked. Especially after I did it, I found that there were, you know, Thingiverse projects where people had designed frames to be printed just like this. But every picture where I saw they had made it, nobody had put motors on it or electronics or anything. It was just a frame they had printed and put together. And I'm like, that's just a waste of plastic. So I, I thought it was pretty cool. So I brought it. Uh, I will be bringing it to Earth. But as a surprise and... If you're on this stream, it won't be a surprise if you show up at Earth. Um, there are a couple of guys that are that are taking this idea and running with it more so than what I did. And if if everything works out all right, I also am going to step up my game for Earth with another iteration of something of this nature. But this printer will be there. I will be bringing it to Earth. I was told by Chris that it had to show up, so it will show up. Uh, some he said he would find a place on a table somewhere for it. I really don't want to have a table of my own. So anyway, uh, but yeah, that's that's it. And just to let y'all know, this is Chris Riley signing off. <laughs> Thanks, Walter. Thank you for joining. Chris, Chris Riley just really switched over to this camera instead. Good night, Uncle Walt. <laughs> Good night, Uncle Walt. Uncle Walt. That's Uncle Walt. So yeah, one, one more uh, one more question going back to the robotics. Uh, Matt from How I Do It wanted to know from Ross if he uses gear generator or sketch for designing your gears. I use a gear generator made by a guy named Ross Korsky for Fusion 360. It's a free plugin that you can get, and it works really well. And it's using that same uh, pattern that was patented by NASA? Uh, I, I like to say that I invented it and NASA stole my idea 10, 10 years before I thought of it. But uh, yeah, it's the same concept as NASA patented back in 2002. And it, the way it looks like the gears are designed, the um, they interlock in some way so that there's no way for a gear to pop out of the planetary gear. Am I understanding that design properly? Uh, yeah, the basic concept is uh, to... The basic concept to get it to do that is just the herringbone gears themselves. And then on this set, they actually use a pitch diameter circle to hold the gears centered on each other, which is a, a new thing that uh, Ross Korsky actually thought of and, and designed this one with. I mean, this is what 3D printing is doing for us. I, I'm, I'm so excited to be part of this. Like I, I just got my printer in March last year. So I'm, uh, I'm a little bit, no, I think I received it April. So I'm um, just a, a little bit over a year of having my printer. And I'm to the point now where I want to do something really cool with it on the lines of what Ross is doing. So my first thing is to take an engineer's approach. Let's see if I can replicate what somebody else has done. And then once I do that, use that as, okay, the experience is gained there. Let's take it to the next level. And is that how you approach things, Chuck or uh, Ross? I, I approach things more from an inspiration sense. Uh, as, as you probably know with my robotics project, uh, rather than learning about it before going into it, I just uh, bullhead my way through it and just keep working on it without researching it. And once I uh, figure out that I did it wrong, I do some research and uh, go back to the drawing board and try it again. Uh, but it would also be smart to learn from other people. 
Yeah, I'd say mine is more I, some inspiration, some engineering. A lot of what I'm doing is like I like I said, I've been doing it for years, so it's it's a repeat of some of what I'm doing, or but applying in a new way with the 3D printing and just the fact that you can build what you can build with a 3D printer is still fascinating to me. Um, I mean, when when I first saw a 3D printer, shit, this was like 30 years ago. You know, these are three hundred thousand dollar machines, and and I was just I was blown away that you could actually make something. So I always kept my eye on it. But when it finally got to the point where I could bring one home and and uh, actually do something with it, it all the all the ideas that have been in the back of my mind just started to come. So it's it's a lot of inspiration. Um, probably less engineering in many ways now because a lot of what I do is just repeat of stuff I've done before. The electronics, the electronics and most of the stuff I'm doing is really just basic crap. It's it's just stuff I've done many times before. Oh, well, there goes all the magic from Chuck. <laughs> 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 Nothing special. It's just, you know, I, I wanted to comment, that, Ross, the statement that you made that, you know, like you just dive into it and do it yourself until you make a mistake and then you go and research it. Um, I'm kind of the same way. And I, and I think that that's a really great way to go about stuff because I mean, yes, you may go through a lot of work to replicate something that somebody else did, but you may also stumble upon a better way to do something than just copying what's already out there. So, I mean, I realized that, you know, you had this great idea for your gears and then come to find out somebody else did it. But that's still a huge compliment to you and your brain, unless you were reading NASA's site while you were sleeping and didn't realize that you had actually taken the idea. But you know what I'm saying? Like invention, invention comes when you let your brain do stuff and all of a sudden you find a better way to do it or you mistakenly discover a better way to do it. Either way, that's a, it's, a great, it's a great way to go as far as I'm concerned. And I think that's actually a big excuse that I like to use is that maybe I'll discover a better way to do it because I don't learn from other people. Uh, <laughs> so that's one thing that I like to say. I, I wanted to answer a question in the comments is someone asked if the gear plugins are available for Mac. And uh, the one that I use does work for Mac as well as for Windows. So plugins are specific to the platform that's being used on? I don't think they are actually, but I figured I'd answer anyways. Yeah, I thought I thought that the plugins were like almost like a script-based plugin, that it was made around uh, Fusion 360s stuff, and it would work on any platform. But you know, I could be wrong. All right. Uh, let's see. It is eleven o'clock. <clears throat> We don't do uh, we don't do the outros until midnight. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, I I don't. Sometimes people when they host they do it. I think they used to do it every hour, but I, I'm yeah, gonna, it's, let's just it's, run till, yeah, run till good. midnight. Yeah, cool. Uh, it looks like uh, Joel is in the chat and he yeah. wants to know if yeah, I'm no, gonna send him the link. So just tell him I'll send him the link. All right. Just send him the link right now, or else. <laughs> or else. <laughs> Sanders' whole life revolves around Joel. Yeah, Joel. Yeah, he's good. Got to, got to show Joel, Joel that good shirt. People. Hey, Xander, got to show what you're wearing. Stick that in Joel's face. I got this one. <laughs> yeah, because Joel didn't give him a 3D printing nerd shirt. And then Joel, uh -huh. Joel do me a solid and retweet the uh, YouTube link. I put a mention for this video on my channel in the community tab, but uh, it doesn't look like it's really bringing much of an audience, which is unfortunate. It could be too. It's late. If it were a different time, it might it might work out. So uh, let's see, uh, Joel, uh, check your Twitter. You know, the one thing I wanted to say on the design stuff. Um, <clears throat> some of the stuff I'm doing, like I said, I've done it before, but what's fun is doing it in a whole new way that I can share it in a way that I couldn't before back. If you go back, some of these robots, you know, some of these were pieces and stuff that were CNC'd and cut and, um, 
you could buy the pieces, you could buy the kits, but it was hard to just, you know, share the files and say, go build this. That's what I loved about the Tinkercad thing is I could put all the files out there and say, go for it, go, go reproduce this. The files are all free. Now the code's free out there and, and Tinkercad and Tinkercad circuits. So everything is easy to share. And that's, that's what I love. But that's what I love about where we're at with the 3D printing and the open source and everything we're doing. Um, it's 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 so open now that anybody could anybody could play with it. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I, I'm so excited about being a part of this community and and this movement. Uh, so we have Joel Telling. Uh, who's that? You, you you may not know who Joel Telling is, but we'll <laughs> we'll let Joel tell you who he is. So let's do a mic check. Yep, we oh, hear you, Joel. You're up. Hi. Oh, let's see an introduction. Um, hi. My name is Joel. I like to shout words at a camera and someone records it and then makes me look pretty. Is that about, is that about right? Yeah, that's accurate. <laughs> you do an excellent job at that. So uh, tonight's topic, are, are you aware of what our topic is, Joel? I do not know the topic of the night. Okay, so our topic of the night is 3D printing and okay. how... Good. That's good. <laughs> right. Uh, 3D printing and how it can aid in rapid development of robotics. And I invited wow. uh, Ross as a guest co-host. You may know Ross from Gear Down for What. Uh, he, he does some amazing things with uh, robotics uh, and gearing. He, has, he, he was able to lift a car uh, with his 3D printed gears. Failed to. But it moved a little bit, so you lifted it. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, come on, let's call it what it is, right? It worked. Um, then uh, he he created a five degrees of freedom robot, and I I went to school for robotics, uh, Drexel University for electrical electrical engineering and specialized in robotics, and never really used. It. I mean, technically, I did because I was in the automation industry at Siemens. Uh, in R&D, so I selflessly chose this topic because I want to pursue this, and robots have always been something I'm fascinated with. I so, love robots. Yeah, so I tell us about robots, Joel. Love robots. Uh, let's see. Back, I didn't go to any extended school. I didn't go to college. Uh, I, I mean, I took a couple, like a year of community college just because uh, I could do that instead of senior year in high school, and so... That worked out pretty well. Uh, I've never got the chance to play much with robotics, but I've always wanted to, right? Because I love I love robots. I love the idea. I was like I said in my video when I three D printed that folding robot. I mean, for for many Halloweens, I was a robot for Halloween because I had this nice cardboard outfit that my dad made me, and we duct taped it together, and we spray painted it, and I was a robot, robot. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm hoping to just learn a lot tonight from everyone else uh i i mean I, I i've done electronics stuff not not to chuck's level but but i i know my way around some things i used to know the the color bands on the resistors that's pretty good right um uh but uh i i i i mean i can i can talk about 3d printing and rapid prototyping and i could talk about how i would use it or robotics but I'm, I'm willing to bet that there's other people that would uh, that should speak more than i should well we, we i i still want to hear what you have to say so i mean if you could say it in five or ten minutes about what what you think the um how you would apply it uh one of the the things i saw did you see the big robot that was shown at nab like sean cannell and a basic filmmaker went to NEB and they showed this robot that was like five or six degrees of freedom that has the camera as the end effector. And it was able to rotate the camera full 360. You could pan tilt uh, this way all around. And then the whole arm could move around and it could move at nine meters per second. And if you don't understand the metric system, that's pretty damn fast. <laughs> and <laughs> so it, if there's a couple commercials that are out now that the camera work is impossible for a human to do. And you're, you, and I couldn't figure out for the life of me how this thing was shot. Like the camera would pan in, 
then it would pop up above the object. There was somebody holding a cell phone or walking while they were doing something. It would flip in front of them. It would, it would follow them through a room. And then I saw this robot. And then they had a preview of how it did this filming. And I was amazed. And I'm like, oh, that's how they did it. And I'm kind of inspired. To do, I'm doing work with a film company, a local film company that does work with Nat Geo and DIY. And that's the one who I built the coffee table for. And I'm like, hey, guys, you know, what what tools do you need? And I'm like thinking about like things like that. Like the camera slider was the first step, but now I want to like build bigger things. So how would you do it, Joel? Well, when I think of robots and 3D printing, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is James Bruton over at X Robots. Uh, you know, he's he's using 3D printing to, I mean, he's he's prototyping these custom parts for the the robots that he's building or like the, the exoskeleton, all that stuff. But but his uh, his 3D printed parts aren't really prototypes of they they're essentially a finished product. Uh, but you're talking about robots in that uh, more of just uh, the automated side of things, correct? Okay. Uh, I like the idea. Well, I, I think having uh, a robotic uh, cameraman, I think is is perfect. I think. Uh, I didn't see this thing at NAB, but now I'm going to have to go look at it because that sounds freaking amazing. Uh, uh -oh. Look out, John. You're being replaced. <laughs> and now it actually requires an operator. So it, what was really cool, I'll, I'll find the video while somebody's talking. But So what they would do is they program it with an Xbox controller. That is the input device. Really? They, they program it and they create, um, just like you do with Adobe Premiere, and you create uh, key points for like uh, changing something over time, and then it fills in the Is linear motion. Keyframes, it's keyframes essentially. Yeah, it's yeah, keyframes. Key so you, you do a keyframe for a, a particular position. You say, okay, I want it to be here, and then on the screen, there's the keyframe. You see it, and then okay, uh, we want five seconds later, and we want it to be in this position, and then it interpolates the movement to get there. And by the way, you can change the curve in which it approaches there. You can make it linear. You can make it, you know, uh, let's let's ramp up acceleration and then kind of bring it down slowly. Amazing stuff. But then you can do things like in that same timeline, you know, how you can change multiple things like in Adobe Premiere. You can change the timing. You can change the level. Same thing. I can rotate this thing at the same time that I'm panning it, at the same time that I'm moving this arm at, in one time slot. But this then, is fantastic, though, because you're yeah, talking crazy. about – um, you're, you're talking about robots in a way that an editor or a filmmaker understands. We're talking about keyframes. We're talking about uh, interpolation. We're talking about you know ramping up and ramping down movements, which in After Effects, which is the product that I worked on. I mean, that's that's essential. Setting you know keyframes for movement is is what people do. You'll have After Effects projects that are 40, 50, 60 levels deep with all these different layers with all these different keyed properties on it and and if you if you just you just take that and you add a third dimension to it right all of the sudden you're you have this this system for controlling a robot using a convention that most people already know or could wrap their hand around and that's fantastic that's amazing yeah right so that that's that's what was like wow this is it was mind blown for me when i saw this and just the, the motion that's impossible for a human to produce. You, and you can't replace a human because you need an operator. It, it, so Right. Yeah. Right. Because we're talking we're not talking about how how robotic like this sort of robotic thing is going to replace humans or take over jobs or whatever. It's, this is just this is robotics as a tool, just like 3D printing as a tool. This isn't this is it's enabling more creativity rather than rather than you know replacing something or replicating something that already exists. This is adding some. This is another tool in the toolbox, and that's fantastic. Oh, you make me want Sorry. to see it, man. Find yeah, it. Yeah, well, I got it. Right, I got it here. All right. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, this guy here. So Marquez, can you still hear me? Yeah. So this is uh, Marquez's video, and he calls it Dope Tech. And uh, so there you go, Xbox controller, controlling this thing, setting the keyframes, right? 
is, is I mean, how exciting is this? This is insane. Ain't it? And it's got a red on there, which I'm so jealous yeah. about. <laughs> but look, it's doing the focus and the zoom. And there you go. There's the keyframes. That's what I was talking about. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's that's like cheating. <laughs> well, it's it's really it, obviously it was developed by somebody who understands uh, linear and non-linear. Editing. Sure. But I mean, for someone to develop the interface for this in a way that that people will already understand, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, but I mean, look at these motions. Look at how quick it is and smooth, and you can change the acceleration and everything. Oh, so this is the example I was talking about. So you have the he's on the camera. I mean, look at that motion. Impossible for a human to produce. Oh, I mean, right. that's that's. The motion that the camera on the robotic arm just made is that is usually accomplished using uh, After Effects, you know, a special effect that that is usually taking two footage elements and blending them in a certain way with a certain effect. That's but that's real. That's that's practical. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, for for everything, let me post the link of his video for fairness. Wait, I just got. I just got a huge donation. Yeah, someone by yes, the name of did. Ken. Wow. $20. Ken. You got a $5 earlier, just too. Just a, wait, what? So yeah, yeah. Matt, Matt dropped 5 I wasn't even paying attention to chat. This is amazing. So, so I'm blown away. $20. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Guys, this is... Uh, you're killing me, man. I'm, I'm, I'm not worthy <laughs> of this. I am not worthy of this. There's we're, a, we're splitting I, that five ways, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the next Jameson's on me. Actually, I'm drinking a Captain right now on Sprite. Yeah, it's going to get split five ways. The catch is you have to drive to John's house to get it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's uh, so crazy, Ken. And uh, Matt, thank you so much. So I need. So what I got to do is uh, I have to have a banner going across and showing all that. Uh, Ken, I want you to send me your uh, contact info, like if you're on Twitter or something. Um, post that, post your uh, Twitter handle or something in there so I can make sure I follow you. I want to give proper credit. So that's exciting. That totally got me uh, flustered and off topic. Um, and it worked. So I, and it's always the worst when people give you money. Yeah. You know, it's just it's a terrible thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, you know, it's okay. So, back on topic as best I can. The uh the robotic industry is really insane. There's one other cool thing that I want to show. I saw I have to dig it up, so I'll need somebody else to talk while I'm digging it up. Shouldn't take me too long. Um it, anybody understand how to move a, a trailer, an RV trailer, a boat trailer? Um you hook up your truck to it. Uh, or you can uh, cheat and hook up a forklift to it that has, you know, the uh, the ball on the end somehow welded to some device that's hooked up to the the forklift. They got this little device. It's like this big, and it's got uh, tank treads on it, two two tank treads, and it's all it appears to be all metallic, you know, gearing and everything. And it's got the ball on it, and you could sit there with your controller, and it, it looked like a uh, Xbox controller, maybe. And you could sit there and just control forward, backward, left, right to jog your trailer into a parking spot. I and actually, it, had it wasn't like big. That. It was like this big. What's that? I actually had something like that. Uh, if you see on my display picture, it shows a lawnmower. I created it with a couple of wheelchair motors and uh, a special DC driver board and uh, RC remote control, and I had something like that. Dude, that's insane. So where have you been all my life? <laughs> it's like... <laughs> 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 I actually, like, <laughs> I, I later turned that into a remote-controlled lawnmower is what I, what I should have said because it wasn't useful enough to move my boat trailer around. That, that's... That part kind of scares me because that's like almost in the happening. I don't know if you ever saw that movie in Night Shyamalan, I think. Um, 
There's one scene in there involving a mower. Oh, there was yeah. a que- there was a question from Potent Printables about, uh, I guess, for me, right? me and Gear Down. Um, what new aspects of 3D printing do you see influencing robotics, like flexible filaments or whatever? Um, this is this is an area that, uh, I, it, to me, it's more the electronics. The robotics can really benefit from the electronics that we have in our printers now. If you, if you look at the board, any of these boards, even the cheapies, you've got at the center of these boards a Arduino. You've got communication. Some of them have you know, Wi-Fi built in, but uh, you've got all the stepper drivers. You've got servo sockets. You've got power control. Um, you've got connections for temperature sensors, con- temp- uh, connections for switches. And this whole thing has a firmware which is Marlin, which can control the whole thing from G-code. And in addition to that, now we've got these, uh, you know, Simplify 3D and Cura, whatever, that can easily create G-code just by drawing an object. So if you think about it, you could actually take and make any kind of ro- robot based around that 3D printer board, because now you can control motors like your five-axis uh, arm there which are stepper motors, you can control all that from that board. You can have feedback through temperature and, and through even light. Any sensor can go to those inputs. The temperature sensors is just an analog to digital converter. So any kind of sensor that feeds back an analog signal can feed into that board. So it's, it's, it could be light sensors or um, really anything. And it's all contained. And you, and you don't have to really know hardcore code you just have to know the basics of G-code and you can control pretty much anything. So to me, that's the biggest thing that could contribute to robotics out of 3D printing, not necessarily the 3D printing of the plastics. It's the fact that we can get those boards with all that capability and you go buy the thing out of China for 20 bucks. It's just, that blows my mind. It's, we, we didn't have this 10 years ago. Uh, that speak- makes sense. Speaking of electronics, I wanted to mention uh, another thing that I'm getting into is uh, this robot that I built. I built it with all stepper motors, and I drive it with the same drivers we use on our 3D printers. Uh, And the next one I'm going to be working on, unfortunately, uh, will be uh, brushless motors because I found this really cool control board that I'd love to tell you guys about if we have time. I don't know if we have time or not. but Oh, uh, we have time. Okay. Uh, so I phoned this. I should show you a picture of it or send you guys a link. But uh, I, after Murph, I was looking at different ways to control a larger robot with brushless motors. And I actually found a control board called uh, O-Drive. And I got a hold of the company and they agreed to send me a sample to test it out. Uh, so that's really exciting, actually, that uh, I'll get to look into that and see if I can use that in my next robotics project. Well, the other thing is you talk about motors is where I could see we could go is if Robot, if this goes into robotics, where people are using this same electronics to control, say, a robot, then we get into smarter motors where we could have steppers, which I already do, but I mean, we get steppers with built in feedback so they can control the robots better, and which um, that feedback mechanism, those motors will get cheaper as the robotics advance. Now, those motors move into our 3D printers, and now our 3D printers have direct feedback so it, it can you know kind of like what joseph Proust is kind of doing with the trinamic uh drivers where it can sense the the feedback of the motor and that's how it can tell what the position is if we have motors that have direct signal coming back to the board we can position it if we we sense a skip we can put the motor right back where it should be and pick up where we left off and you never even know it skipped so those are the kind of things we get by the motors improving but it's so expensive to do right now we don't see it but that's the thing where robotics can take what we've done, improve it, and then give it back. And, and so it complements 3D printing. It's exciting times. I'm probably going to say that a thousand times in this live stream. Well, what's even more exciting is uh, a skewed view 3D just three twenty more dollars, John. Wait, what? Oh, yeah. How am I oh, missing yeah. this? And Joel just dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> he had to go to dinner. Okay. But, uh, yeah, show him, show him over at a skewed, three, uh, skewed view 3D. He's uh, he's good people. 
Yeah, thank you very I mean, much. I mean, most of these people in the chat, if not all of them, are good people. But I met Sholm. He's a he's a really good guy. Well, oh, there was a there was a yeah, comment. Okay. There was a comment after that says uh, from Justin 3D. It says, "Does Marlin use a closed loop operation for stepper motors?" Uh, no, no, it currently does not. The, everything is open loop right now on our 3D printers. Now it doesn't mean Marlin can't do it. There's feedback. There's all kinds of sensor feedback. So it can be done and then the code would have to be written. But right, so it's not a, it's not difficult. It just, it makes the printer a little more complicated and they're not built that way. But currently Marlin is written just to be open source, move to a position, I hope you get there. There's another 20. No, that's 21. That was an outdo right there. <laughs> what? I can't think straight now. I'm not going to be able to. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do anything. So uh, Ken, Ken has a question. How do I contact you? So uh, Ken, I'm on. I'm on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is u uh, underscore u underscore it. If you're on Twitter, if you're not on Twitter, you can find my email address. Uh, from YouTube, you can go to my about page and say you're not a robot, and it'll reveal my email address. Uh, Eddie, I'm just blown away. This is uh, this is crazy, insane. I really appreciate it. I want to do some crazy stuff with robots. This is uh, exciting times. That's probably number twenty one that I said that. Um, Matt, uh, Matt, how I do it, asked uh, Chuck, can you define open loop versus closed loop on stream, for those who don't know? Uh, I can give that a shot. Uh, open loop, let's just say I got, a, you know, I got a ruler here, and I want to move from this position to this position. So if, if this is the motor driving it to the position, just like your, your John Slider, um, open loop, Open loop is it'll move, and you know it's so many pulses to get to this position. But if there's any resistance, it may skip a pulse, and it may not get there all the way, but the software would never know it. There's no feedback. Where if there was like a sensor sensing the position on this ruler, as the motor is turning, it's actually sending a signal back to the electronics of where it's positioned. So that's closed loop. So it's because it's telling it's I'm moving, and then it's coming back. And you guys are laughing. Is this, is this a poor explanation? So, VB3D just threw $22 down, and then Eddie Moser threw $23 down. Oh, I'm missing all of this. Hey, we talk. have 24. Do we have 24, ladies and gentlemen? You have 24. Oh, I saw this cookie. I'm on 24. No, this is. I, I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry. Sorry, Chuck, I didn't mean to overrun your explanation. We'll, we'll take it off of you. Just send us half now. <laughs> it's just always funny when the bidding war starts. The bidding war. Well, I, I think because I'm talking, you're getting all this money. I think that's what's going on. I keep talking, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> I could be they're so excited about open loop and closed loop. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, anyway, so that's that's really the difference is you don't – closed loop is there's some kind of sensor telling you what, at what position you're at. And so – It'll move. The electronics will then just drive that motor until its sensor tells it you've reached the position. So it knows exactly where it's at. And then it'll stop. So it's a much better system. So let's say you're 3D printing. You got your head moving. All of a sudden, it skips. It knows you didn't complete the full movement. So it'll keep driving the motor until it senses that it, you reached that position. So even though it skipped, you'd never know it in your print because it actually reached that point. So that's what closed loop. The closed loop is basically sensors that are telling the electronics, yeah, I reached my point. I reach where I'm I'm going. And that's that's hopefully hopefully explains it. Ross has uh, something to show, it looks like. So this is I mean I'm just blown away. I, I can't say thank you enough. It's crazy. Thank you, everyone. I do have this uh, thing I want to show. Uh, let's see. Let me share my screen. Share this application. So it's called the Trailer Valley. Can you still hear me? Yep. 
So, little mini robot. So, of course, it's, you know, made of metal. There may be a little bit of plastic in there, but I'm sure that they got all the gears that go through all the wheels and everything. But assuming there's not a extremely rough and unlevel surface, uh, you can see in it. As soon as I saw that, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's there's Ross's uh, planetary gears. And uh, he did some testing with the capability of the printed gears and and what it can do as far as weight. And, you know, and the, but that was really, I don't think he experienced anything where the gears themselves were breaking. I think it was the stepper was skipping steps. That guy, that place. guy looked entirely too pleased to be doing that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, he had right. That really smug look on his face, like, like, oh yeah. Right, right. So Ross, you had a you had a video uh, where you were talking about uh, the amount of force uh, viewed at the end of uh, the effector. Or at the end of an arm. I think he recorded like nine pounds or something at one point. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you're talking about the most recent efficiency testing video. Yeah. Uh, where the idea was, uh, the idea was mostly to test how efficient uh, transferring energy through this is. So theoretically, if you have a 66 to 1 gearbox and you have a motor that can output, let's say, one pound foot of torque or one foot pound, as people would call it. Uh, technically, through a 66 to 1 gearbox, you should get 66 times more torque, so 66 foot-pounds, uh, well, and that would be at a foot away. So I was doing efficiency testing, and because it's impossible to transfer energy at 100% efficiency, uh, you need to know what efficiency your gearbox is to build a robot with it. So I actually got a figure of about 20% efficiency for this one, which is pretty bad. Uh, but I have a new video that, that'll be coming out maybe tomorrow or the next day that'll show that I've got another one that I hit uh, about 40% efficiency on. So that's pretty good, actually, compared to the 20 that I came out with originally. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, what's the... Um, if you use, like, a direct drive instead... So, like a DC motor, is that what you were saying that you would get more torque out of it, maybe, than a stepper? Uh, well, with the idea with the brushless motor is uh, not so much to get more torque off the hop, but to be able to increase the speed of the motor more. So, for this robot, the main problem with this robot is besides the fact that it only has four axes, um, is that it's really, really slow, and I. Uh, the more I speed it up, the less it's able to lift, and the more I speed it up, the more likely it is to skip a step because the stepper motors lose so much torque after, like, 300, 400 RPM that after that speed, they just can't go any faster. Uh, so if you use brushless motors, for example, you might get the same torque at a zero speed, but you could have the same amount of torque throughout the full RPM range all the way up to, say, 1,500, 2,000 RPM. Uh, especially for a brushless motor of really low KV value, we really have the torque in the lower end. Uh, so that's why, why I really want to go into using brushless motors for something like this. But is that, was, was that your question? Yeah, that was. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to understand the, uh, the reasoning behind that. Yeah, that's, uh, this is good stuff. So, like, I have a little bit of experience with quadrature, quadrature, encoders uh, which will give you like I don't know 8,000 points per revolution to measure um, the amount something turned so you can use that for exact closed loop feedback I mean 8,000 into 360 I mean that's a significant amount especially when you gear it down your resolution would be even higher yeah, that's actually uh, an interesting thing to bring up is that uh, the encoders that come with these motors are incredibly accurate. But the funny thing is, is that for how fast I want them to spin, I don't think there's any way the Arduino board could make a full scan before the encoder would actually see the next pulse. So for me, all I would really need is an encoder that has like eight pulses per revolution, especially if I have a 60 to one drive before it. 
Yeah, so if you're 60 to 1, 8, yeah, you're 480, somewhere around there, 500. Yeah, whatever. Steps per revolution, maybe. Well, I guess maybe then you would want more than uh, eight steps, eight eight things per uh, revolution. But uh, still, you don't need the crazy amount that most encoders have. It's uh, it's uh, quite excessive. So when you get into robotics, right? So intellectual. This is where electrical engineering helps out. So intellectual engineering, you learn. There's there's a core curriculum associated with electro, electrical engineering. Uh, of course, you have your circuit theory, uh, but then you get into control theory. You also get into um, DSP, and DSP is digital signal processing, and that's where you'll typically have an ADC that's an analog to digital converter that allows you to have the um, microprocessor understand an analog signal. And in that course, you begin to understand um, scan rates, or what's called uh, the Nyquist frequency. And the the point behind that is that whatever you're scanning at whatever frequency, uh, you need to scan it at twice the rate at which whatever the event is happening at. So let's say you have a signal that's occurring every... Uh, uh, with a period of you know, or a frequency of 100 megahertz and you want to make sure you capture that signal without aliasing you have to scan it at 200 megahertz so it has to be twice the frequency that you're reading minimum. and that's minimum yeah so and that's what you were leading to um, there ross is that you know you have to have some fast stuff if you're going to handle uh, reading in pulses that are like maybe 8,000 pulses per revolution. So yeah, you would need a fast a fast board that can handle it. And I do not know how fast uh, Arduino can process that. So. Well, it's slow. I mean, it, that the, I did a video on that where I talked about, uh, you know, we we're talking about the limitations of Arduino as far as code and everyone wants to go to a 32-bit board for, 3D printers because it'll be better. And and I'm not saying 32-bit doesn't have more capability. It's definitely needed for deltas because of the amount of math that's that's going on. But Arduinos themselves were designed with a software that was easy for anyone to use. If you've ever written any kind of true embedded code, you look at Arduino and you use like this is crap. I don't even want to use this. Right? It's it's written so kids can can use it it's written so it was written for schools it was written to teach 3d or not 3d uh, teach c programming in the college level just you know to get people used to the language and how to use it it's just it, the open source had just exploded so everyone was doing it but as far as a control system it's really crap it's really slow so you can actually take that same microcontroller that's in an arduino and you can program with a true compiler that doesn't you know use the arduino library that's just bloat and fat and you can easily run 15 times faster than what arduino runs at so it's got well, like a 16 megahertz processor in it so multiply that you know whatever you're getting multiply it times 15 times and you're not getting anywhere close to 16 megahertz in arduino so um you can get close to that 16 megahertz instruction cycle uh if you're writing true true code that's that's compiled to a true like assembly down to you know uh, what the true ones and zeros you want to do so that's one of the limitations of of really of our 3d printers is that we base everything on arduino which is one of the slowest microcontrollers out there to use but it's so open source and so easy it's made it easy for everyone to use so as you start to get into robotics and you want to do this thing faster or you want that feedback like some people are asking, you know, what's the difference between the hard and soft and, and what uh, Prusa does with the MK3. Um, it's amazing what Prusa has actually been able to do with the 8-bit Arduino, that they're getting the feedback from the trinamics. Because what they're really relying on is the motor. When the motor turns, it produces a little spike. Every time a motor turns, a little spike is generated in the coils. And the trinamic drivers can actually measure that and send that signal back to the Arduino. 
So the faster the motor, the harder it is for the Arduino to read. So they can only go so fast. So the fact that the MK3 prints as well as it does and prints as fast as it does just shows how those guys have really tuned the, the board and the Arduino to work well together. But there's a lot more we could do if we went to better electronics on the 3D printers. There's no doubt. Yeah, I, I had the luxury of working on embedded systems when I was at Siemens. And we used the Motorola uh, processors like the 6800 series, uh, 68320 or something. We even had the smaller ones, the HC11s. Um, then for some side projects, you know, we would work on a microchip, which I think microchip was pretty fast. Um, well, they're all about the same speed. I mean, the HC11, the microchip picks, the, uh, the uh, AVR, Atmel AVR, they're all 8-bit microcontrollers. And so they all pretty much run about the same. Uh, yeah. And now now microchip bought Atmel, so it's, you know, they're one in the same company. And the HC11 is kind of phased out because Freescale got bought out and that's gone. But uh, so, but that's that's all the same. It's it's really in that 8 megahertz to 32 megahertz range. So when you get to 32 bit, of course, the speeds go way up and there's a lot more you can do. Plus, you can do a lot more in a single instruction. So there's there's more things that can happen in a shorter clock cycle. So that's how, you know, like our computers are light years ahead of any of the stuff we're talking about. Um, but so that's a limitation. But that's what I still I'm an 8 bit guy. I go way back. I love the 8 bit micros and what you can do with them. And that's why I love that we still are running 3D printers doing some amazing things with 8-bit. And the Prusa MK3 running 8-bit with the Trinamic drivers, which is kind of a kind of a hard feedback, you know, because of the the, the way the signal is sent back through the Trinamic drivers. It's it's really opened up what what we can do, and that's that to me is what Prusa has really given us lately um, that I haven't seen you know other printers capture or figure out yet. Yeah, no, this is, it's exciting times. <laughs> I think that's number 23, I said. Um, I've actually got some of those Trinamic drivers on my 3D printer, and I absolutely love them. They're pretty awesome. Uh, can you tell me more about a Trinamic driver? Is that the company that manufactures them? Uh, yeah, if you're referring to the TMC 2130s, uh, they're, they're stepper drivers that are extremely silent, and they've also got detection for a skipped step, uh, and they, they actually connect back to the core of the Arduino with, uh, I think, I2C. So the Arduino can talk through software from the Arduino board to the stepper driver, uh, which is, I think is a really cool feature because then you could set your, uh, your resolution. You can set how much current the stepper driver takes right through software. Uh, you don't have to mess around with little screwdrivers and potentiometers anymore. They're, they're really cool drivers. Are you using the feedback in them? The feedback uh, capability? I, I tried using them as end stops, if that's what you're asking about, and, and actually it didn't work for me. But I ended up meeting the Trinamic guys at MRF, and they said I needed to probably install more capacitors on my board. So I'm going to try that someday and see if I can get that end stop feature to work too. Okay. Was it stopping too early? Yeah, it was triggering too early, even with the highest and lowest setting. So I, I tried everything, and I couldn't get it to work, but I'm guessing yeah. it's probably a capacitance issue. Well, what it was, you're getting too many pulses. You're getting too many um, signals, so the micro will trigger on any of those. So by adding capacitance, what you're basically doing is you're slowing down and filtering out those extra spikes. So only the big spike that you're looking for will get through. So that's the, the capacitors just form a low-pass filter. They block you. They'll block any of the high frequency stuff and only let the slow stuff go through, which is what you want in, in most cases. So, but but again, that's it's going to be slow. I think uh, someone mentioned here, Ken. He said the step generation basically limited to forty kilohertz on an Arduino. So you know, forty kilohertz, and we're talking the Arduino runs at sixteen megahertz. So you can just see that you know it's it's a a, a factor slower in trying to sense this stuff. So as we get deeper into what the trinamics can do, what the better drivers can do, that's when we're going to start to realize that we need 32-bit boards or we need better software, which we're not going to tear up Marlin. So we're probably going to go to 32-bit Marlin and 32-bit boards. 
in order to really see this feedback come to life in 3D printing and, you know, robotics. Are we at a, are we at a point where we can have 32 bit Marlin boards? Yeah, no, there's 32 bit Marlin board, 32 bit firmware out there. It's not as complete, but you got smoothieware. There's other, uh, 32 bit firmware is out there running. Um, there's 32 bit machines, even that, that MP select mini, that monoprice MP select mini, which is a Malian M200 that's running a 32 bit board. You know, that's like a $200 printer, but that's got a 32 bit board in it. So it's, it's out there. We just don't, we're not using its full capability. Uh, what, what was this driver? The Trinetic. I'm on their website now. TMC 2130. Um, and actually, this pro this robot originally, when I programmed it, my programming was so bad, uh, I I didn't know what I was doing, and I ended up uh, having to use an Arduino Do or a thirty two bit board to, to to program this thing, and a lot of it was because I insi insisted on using a uh, thirty two micro steps, so uh, that became a problem with this, and I've actually ended up just sticking with the thirty two bit board just because I don't want to switch back. The 32-bit, too, is getting cheaper. The micros themselves, the 32-bit micros are actually getting cheaper than a lot of the 8-bit because they can produce it on a smaller die, so they can produce more chips on a, on a wafer. And it looks like you got, you got another uh, donation there. Chris came through. Oh, my God, $23.01. <laughs> 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 he had a beat top dog. Yeah, brother, I appreciate that, man. This is I am I am so not worthy of this. So uh, thank you so much. Is this the most you've ever made on a live stream? Might want yes. to do this every night. Yes, this is this is amazing. No, I really appreciate it, guys. Yeah, so you got to have us talk electronics and stuff. That's what's doing it. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna throw your uh, it's hey. gonna throw your analytics all off for their for your financial. <laughs> Chuck, can you yeah, right. come over on our stream and start talking all smart? <laughs> all smart. <laughs> as long as you wear that shirt, man, I'll do it. Okay. As long as you wear okay. maybe, maybe that's what it is. It's not what we're talking about. It's the fact that, that Xander's wearing a Tep shirt. Yeah, right. Like, In Chris's basement. In Chris's basement. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Chuck, by the way, I need to get one of those shirts. Do you sell them on your site? Do you have a merch? No, that was... It was it's funny. That was a one-off thing. Um, Mara at uh, Matter Hackers, she contacted me. She goes, hey, you know, I wanted to... Holy crap, look at your screen now. Mic drop. <laughs> what? And it's showing up red. Like, the other one was, like, orange, and this is, like, red. It's, like... <laughs> holy crap, the, comment, the comment is mic drop. <laughs> that's just... Oh, my God. This is, that trumps I, all, man. That trumps all. <laughs> This is insane. <laughs> well, that's, this is that probably shut me up. For this, I'm not even getting any money. That's just that's amazing. That's that, that wasn't even donation. our donation, and it broke Xander. And, and everybody's like, "Oh crap! Oh shiznit! Oh crap! Oh crap! Oh crap! Oh okay, Eddie wins. Ron saying, game over." <laughs> Oh, look, Mike is asking. Eddie has John's credit card info. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we're streaming from my channel next time. Yeah, right. <laughs> Dude. Yeah, that is something, man. So crazy. All right, well, All right. I got the, uh, the You Do It the you do it squad in the house. Pretty much everybody is a uh, <laughs> moderator, so if anybody tries to come in and start uh, talking smack, they're going to get booted real fast. So, <laughs> and it, I lost track. I got track. Oh, you're asking about the shirts. That's right. So, so Mara, Matter Hacker, uh, contacted me. She goes, Hey, I'm going to be doing another, you know, Matter Hacker minute or whatever. She goes, she goes, Would you want me to wear your shirt? And I go, Well, I really I don't have any shirts. You know, I, I, And just like that, the aliens got him. <laughs> Again. We'll never know about the shirt. And he magically disappeared. <laughs> you better oh come back God. in or I won't be able to sleep tonight. I want to know what happened with the shirts. <laughs> <laughs>
Guys, this is again. I'm truly humbled. This is like. Can you see how red my face is? Oh, Chuck's back. Oh, thank God. Please, Chuck, finish the story. We thought we'd never know what happened with the shirt. <laughs> so, so I, I quickly, I told her, I says, "Well, I could probably get a shirt for you if you're willing to wear it." And uh, so I'm like, "What size?" She gives me a size, and I'm like, "Well, I should have a few of these built up." So I just went, I found some company that did it. I, I wasn't even that happy with, you know, the quality of the shirts, but I had some made and I sent them to, sent them to her and uh, she wore it, she wore it in the episode, but then I had a couple extra. I gave them to people and Sandra got to actually the last one. So. Wow. The last of the lot. It's right. That's what I really, item. I I'll actually sell it on eBay that. for like, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, whatever you can get, man. I'm I'm game. So I, I am now approved uh, with the Amazon merch. I submitted my application. It's not that great. It's it's not. You tried it. I I haven't made hardly anything from Amazon merch. It just doesn't work. No, that, that's I'm not concerned about making the uh, making average money. I'm concerned about twenty bucks a month with it. For Come for on. your, I'm talking I'm talking about the Amazon merch where you can sell your shirts, your oh. merchandise. Oh, so, never mind. Yeah, no, this is separate from Amazon affiliate. Um, the um, the idea is that they provide they front all the costs associated with producing merchandise, which a lot of these companies are doing now. So you don't have to worry about buying 5,000 shirts to meet some, you know, price point. So you can sell the shirts at a reasonable price. Uh, you apply for the program, I, which I did. And they said it would take up to 60 days to approve. And I was approved within five days, I think. And now they said, Hey, great. You're approved. And now, um, no, John Mack, there's a, there's lack of contact right now. So I'm not sure what's going on there. I, ho I hope them the best for them, but I'm not sure what's going on. Um, so the um, you, you just upload your artwork, and then apparently you can specify any type of merch. You can do hoodies. You can do T-shirts. You can do stickers, uh, notepads. Uh, envelopes, you know, the, the whole line of merchandise you can do. And you can choose to do it with um, uh, cost. So it's like you're, you're just listing the merchandise just to get your name out there. Or you can do it where you, you assign it um, a value, like $5 more than cost. So let's say it costs $15 for a shirt. Sell for twenty bucks, you'll make five dollars every time somebody buys your shirt. But see, I would do it at, at this stage where I'm I'm new. I mean, I've been at this for two and a half years, but let's face it, I'm new. Um, I would do it at the rate of cost just to get my shirts out there. So, do you know about how much they're they're going to be asking per shirt? I think it might be twenty dollars a shirt. But I'll know more as soon as I set it up, and I will get back to you right away. I'm going to have to get on, in on that. I like that idea. Yeah. You want to buy my shirts? Is that it? I, I want to sell my own shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understood what you meant. Yeah, the so that's the idea. Yeah, the people I mentioned, Cafe Press. Cafe Press has been around for a long time. I used those guys way back. I actually published my second book on Cafe Press with that same way. So they've been doing that for a while. I didn't know Amazon was doing that same thing now. Yeah, so you can see the comment from Heck Monkey. You know, Amazon merch is, uh, they're trying to, yeah, Amazon is huge, right? I mean, so they're yeah. going after everything. And that's what Heck Monkey's saying, going after Zazzle and Cafe Press and everybody else who's doing it. And the, the problem is, is that you have a company like March Minion who could uh, do well in this, but... You know, the Amazon can, can come in and steal everybody's thunder uh, mm -hmm. with that. But, you know, uh, the other avenue is, okay, as a creator, I want to get my stuff out there. Amazon will push it.
because they want to make a sale. So it could come up as recommended in somebody's feed. And Amazon, just like Facebook, is listening to everybody's conversation. And if you happen to say you do it, you might get a shirt presented to you tomorrow in an ad <laughs> from Amazon. <laughs> you don't even have to say it. If you just think about it. There is that, too. Oh. Yeah. It's, it's happened more than once. It is really, really, really creepy. Yes, it is. It's happened to me, and I swear I never talked about it. And somehow, boom, there's an ad. And I'm like, no. Yep. 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 They're listening to our thoughts now. I don't know how they've done it, but <laughs> I don't like it. It's super creepy. I don't like it. So, in fact, uh, it was really funny because uh, my wife, I, I don't. I was I was watching an episode of Rick and Morty on my computer that was locally stored on my computer, and my wife the next day on her Facebook had uh, an ad for a Rick and Morty coffee cup that said like great great gifts for husbands or something like that, and I said that, that's just it's just too much. Well, it's, I'm done. It's too much. I don't. <laughs> I gotta get off the internet. Well, yep. All right, so yeah, oh, that would be something where if you say I want to order a you do it shirt and they send me Matt shirt instead, <laughs> <laughs> there's always this confusion. At least in the beginning, it was funny in the beginning because I would join somebody's live stream. I would be in a live stream. Matt would join in, or no, I join in, and they would say hi, Matt, and I'm like, who's Matt? That's because this is before I even knew Matt at the time. It was just funny because you both have do it in your name and you both have a black and white logo and. <laughs> You know, yeah. yeah, that was funny. All right, so look, we're at the uh, point. Let, let's do the uh, the twelve o'clock outros. We're not stopping uh, because we can keep talking, uh, and it'll we can talk about anything at that point once we reach the twelve hour. How many we got still watching? Uh, we are at uh, quite a 21. bit. Twenty-one. Yep, twenty-one. Wow. Yeah. So it's good. You know, yeah, it helps out. So uh, we'll start with Chuck. You can go ahead. Tell me, uh, tell us all about you, how we find you, what you do. Okay. Um, you know, I never talk about it. I, I, I've explained my channel, Filament Friday, do 3D printing, some CNC, some electronics. But, you know, if I go back, some of you guys may not even realize I've been like involved in electronics in a hobbyist level and that since like 1998 my first website was electronic products i've written 10 books on electronics software and stuff i've written hundreds of articles i had a column in nuts and bolts magazine for four years where i did uh, um, just articles about electronics and and some robotics i even had some articles in servo magazine on robotics and uh, i just i've been doing this for a long time I had an Arduino before there ever was an Arduino. I mean, I had, it was my own creation, a lot of similarities, uh, but it was more based on basic, embedded basic versus C, because I thought that was easier for people to get started. And I, I think it was, but it just didn't really click with the professionals like Arduino did. And, our, you know, those came together, professionals and hobbyists. So, so I've been doing this stuff for a, a long, long time. And, um, the 3D printing is relatively new. That's it's something that's I've been doing really the last four years has really been my main focus. It's been fun. The electronics has kind of taken a back seat. CNC is something I always wanted to have, and I finally I got one through the channel. I was fortunate enough that Inventables, you know, sent me one, and uh, I did some videos for them. So so that's there. I wish I could do more with it, but that's why you see on the channel you see 3D printing a lot of 3D printing now. Uh, I try to throw some electronics in there. I'm trying to figure out how I can fit more in and then some CNC. So if you're interested in any of those things, hey, hit me up in the comments or send me an email or whatever. And maybe I'll include it in a future episode. But that's what I do. That's what I do at Filament Friday. And um, I'm just having fun. That's all I'm trying to do. All right. Thank you, Chuck. All right. Now we're on to uh, Glenn and Xander. Well, as everybody in the whole world knows, I'm I'm Glenn. I'm Xander. He's all he's all into building this robot. Uh, we are Fun King 3D. We are a father and son team that does uh, 3D printing and and not nearly as many electronic projects as 
Chuck does. Um, in fact, we haven't done one in a while, but uh, the only um, one we did was before. Yeah, it's been a while. Before we got our so, printer. Um, we are seven days, well now I guess technically six days off. On, on the 27th of, of April is our one year birthday of the start of Fun King 3D. It, it's not one year that we've had a printer. We started the channel before our printer ever arrived, but uh, we are almost one year old and that's, that's pretty exciting. And we've come a long way in a short time, thanks to uh, certain people, Joel. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's, been a, it's been a fun road. We've had a good time. Uh, I've officially started printing parts for the, um, the mostly printed CNC machine because I, too, want to get into CNC. And I'm not fortunate enough to have anybody send me one for the channel. Um, but if they want to, that'd be okay. But in the meantime, I'm going to build this uh, mostly okay. printed CNC machine. And uh, I'm actually printing it currently in uh, a PETG that is made by IC3D that uh, is not available anywhere in the world. I got one of two rolls, and I love bragging about that because I think that's just really, really cool to have one of the only two rolls in existence. But um, we have uh, uh, a couple big projects coming up. We are uh, gearing up for the R2-D2. I've started to put the files together for that so um we're going to do a, a fully 3d printed r2d2 which will be really cool and uh, a couple other things that we can't talk about yet which are the worst kind it's the worst kind knowing about projects that you can't talk about so uh xander does xander's thing thursday every thursday at 12 noon eastern standard time where he uh prints out something 3d and talks about it talks about the filament that we use and uh Anything else? Did I free anything? And he's building a robot, and he's really into it, and well, and he's getting angry. <laughs> Is that it? Is there, so. there a picture of what that thing's supposed to look like when he's done? Yeah, he showed the box. I didn't see that. I came in late. Can you see that? Ah, that looks like fun. Oh, that'll be fun. It, uh, yeah, it's definitely cool. It like chucks, no pun intended. It chucks ping pong <laughs> balls. So. It, uh, it came as a two-pack. One was a remote control ant, which has got all kinds of sensors. You can set it to autonomous mode or you can control it. And uh, so he's been playing with that. He built that right after Christmas. And this one, he's been – he's a little intimidated by this because it's ages 14 to 18. And uh, so he wanted to do it while we were streaming just so that I was sitting here. But he's been doing it all on his own. So um, – Oh, there's all kinds of stuff going on. I see my name popping up everywhere. Um, they want to know about the CNC. Well, Eddie Moser says, did you know we actually do not see 3D? I don't know what that means, but okay. Uh, uh, Justin, uh, can you send me the link to the mostly printed CNC plans? Thanks. Um, Justin, don't be lazy. Go to Thingiverse and search mostly printed CNC. It's, it's there. It uh, links to their website. There's, uh, a, there's another site, though, Vicious 3D or something. Yeah, the, the link is right in the description. On, on, if you go to Thingiverse, the link to their website is right on there. So, and it's, um, it's been, it's not real easy to necessarily figure out. Like the name of the part in the parts list doesn't match the name of the part on Thingiverse, but. But you'll figure it out. It's not. It's not horrible. But um, but uh, uh, Tony Ryan like said to... you may have fancy filming, but my MPCNC is running. Well, I, I just started. I just started printing it. So so I guess that's. I guess that's it for me. So no, that's good stuff. All right, uh, Ross, tell us about you. What you like to do on your channel? How we can find you? And. Um, uh, we'll get somebody to post the links to to the channels again. Actually, no. You know what? We can find your channel just by right-clicking on your name. Just type something in chat. But go ahead, Ross. You're up. Um, so my name is Ross. I uh, have a 3D printing channel called Geared On For What, where I design uh, cool robotic stuff and uh, gearboxes and whatnot. And uh, I got started about uh, just over a year ago when I uh, bought a 3D printer. And am I up on screen here, or is this uh, Chuck? No, you're on screen. Oh, okay. I'm looking at Chuck, but okay. 
Uh, anyways, I got started about a year ago uh, when I bought a 3D printer and designed a gear set, and, and I was really intrigued by how it worked. And I wanted to build something cool with it, and so I decided to try to build one uh, that I could build a robot with, and I ended up building this. So I call this the Geared On For What robot. It's a pretty pointless robot because I haven't really programmed it to do anything other than be able to move in a straight line, which it doesn't even do that effectively. But uh, it's still a cool demonstration model, and it can lift a lot of weight if you attach the, the base to something. Uh, and then I've done other projects where I designed a gearbox to uh, basically lift weights. Like I tried to lift a car with it, uh, which didn't really work, but I was able to lift up like an anvil. And I made another one where I was able to move approximately a thousand pounds when I tied it between my truck and a tree. Uh, so that was a pretty cool invention that I had. And uh, yeah, the channel's called Geared On For What? If you want to check it out, there's a you can click on my name over in the chat. I'll type hello. And I think that's all. That's all and I then got. Um, post it while, while I'm talking. Grab your Twitter links and uh, throw them in there too. Twitter for me, I think the only person who doesn't like Twitter is Chris, maybe. But uh, Twitter is not dead, contrary to what a lot of people say. A lot of business happens on Twitter. And uh, it's where you can get a quick... Hey, you know, this is me, or what kind of tacos are you eating tonight? And that's pretty much what goes on. <laughs> we talk about 3D printing, but as soon as somebody posts a photo of a of a uh, taco, that's it. Game over. So, I'm John. Uh, I run this channel, You Do It. I started this channel in December of 15. I... Uh, was uh, determined uh, to do something meaningful. I, I've always done my own work as much as I could. Uh, I, I don't like doing roofs, and I don't like doing concrete, but I will pretty much do everything else in my house, uh, putting up a wall, knocking down a wall. Um, and one of the things that I've done is ground molding with lighting, and that video really took off, and that's what inspired me to do more on my channel. Um, I'm at a point now where my channel is kind of plateauing and dipping a little bit, so I have to, uh, not so much rush, but I have to pay more attention to this uh, coffee table that I designed and get that video series up, which is a coffee table that I built over Christmas break for a film production company. You can find me on Twitter at you underscore do underscore it, on Instagram you dot do dot it. Um, if you're on Twitch, you can find me uh, U D O I T two, which is the same as my channel name here that uh, that I have on YouTube. And uh, if you would do me a solid there and just hit me with a follow on Twitch, uh, it doesn't cost you anything to follow me. Just hit that follow button, and I'll post a link to my uh, Twitch there. I am just trying to diversify myself in preparation for Edpocalypse 4, which apparently is looming after some recent news that I just read today. So um, anyway, I do a lot of tinkering. I've always tinkered. Like I started taking apart my dad's stereo when I was like five or something, desoldered all the components. And that's how I got my start in electronics. Um, and now we have a taco war and burritos we're talking about in chat. So um that's pretty much it for the outros and now it's like a free-for-all <clears throat> we could talk about anything technical um anything in uh it doesn't necessarily have to be 3d printed related it's nice if it would but at least technically related and it could be even related to production stuff you do for your channel how how you come up with your videos so the floor is open well, with that open, I gotta, I gotta take off. My uh, iPad battery is dying, and I can't charge it from where it's at. Sure, but uh, it's pretty late for me anyway. So, thanks for uh, having me on, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here, Chuck. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Nice thanks for wearing the shirt, Xander. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's no good. Shirt. Yeah. All right, we'll All see right. you guys on the tube. All right, thanks, Chuck.
Yeah, that's a yeah. that was a good conversation that we had there with uh, Chuck. Um, so he's, from a, he's a real. I mean, I mean, he's a smart guy, but he's a very good resource. Um, oh, he's still on here. I got to stop talking about. Him. Yeah, <laughs> I tried to get off. <laughs> I would not try to listen. <laughs> It feels That's weird when you, say, when you say stuff like that about people and they're here. But, you no, know, Chuck is, like, so smart. I, I love talking to him. I love, you know, getting information from him. And then, you know, of course, I watch every video that he releases just because even if it's not something directly that I want to, to see, it's – I get something out of it that I might be able to use somewhere else. So, yeah, his stuff, his stuff is great. So. Yeah, the fact that he wrote 10 books. I mean – just writing the first book is it, it's almost like making like a hundred videos. I mean, the effort that you have to put in the writing the book. Yeah. I don't know if I know enough about any one subject to put a whole mm -hmm. book together. Like I know a lot of stuff, but it's like, I just Not know, enough to make I know a, a little bit about a lot of things. Like <laughs> it would be a very yeah. weird book to read. <laughs> like the architect. Uh, someone asked in the comments, is someone prepping to dive into content creation? Uh, I would love to hear the process everyone uses, planning, execution, lead, time, yeah. engagement. Uh, I think, Ross, with your, uh, with your videos, you can, you can talk about that. Me, certainly. I can. So, so let me uh, just, just do my five minutes on that, and then I'll hand it over to you guys. Um, for me, uh, it's, I'll make a video about a particular topic. Uh, up to the point of 3D printing. So let's pick everything prior to me doing 3D printing videos. Um, if I'm doing something around the house, if I'm replacing a filter in my heater, if I'm replacing a filter in my truck, I will just grab the camera and I will perform the operation, whatever it is, and I will talk to the camera and explain what I'm doing. And then I'll take that uh, footage and... Uh, bring it in and edit it and we could talk about that if you want to know more about that but that's how i i filmed the video um the one where i did the crown molding if you go to my channel the main page my channel page you'll notice um my signature videos and i call them signature videos because they're the ones that are bringing my channel the most growth um you'll see the crown molding video and in that video i just put the camera in place and demonstrated me doing things and it was probably four hours of footage that I condensed down to like maybe seven or 17 minutes. I forget how long the video is. Um, and I edited it in Adobe Premiere, uh, which, which is an easy program to use once you get a little bit of training. So it's, um, it's good stuff. So you can uh, go ahead, Ross. Are you talking, Ross? You mean? Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't have my microphone on. Uh, so for me, there are two ways that I go about planning uh, content that I'm going to make and put on my channel. One of them is uh, a purely a selfish, uh, this video is gonna get a lot of views and make a lot of money. And, and the way I go about that is I come up with some crazy idea or a friend will propose something to me. And uh, I'll just build off of that. And normally when I wanna make a really good video, pretty much the most important thing about that video is gonna be the thumbnail. And so I come up with something that would be really enticing for the thumbnail and then try to make a video idea based off of that, which might be a little bit backwards and crazy, but it, it seems to be working pretty good for some things. Um, and another way I go about a video is I just get really, really passionate about something. I find something that I really wanna do, a goal that I just really wanna achieve. And I'm able to use the funding from the, the other videos to, to fund weird stuff like this. And uh, occasionally, like uh, I just made a video about a ratcheting CVT thing. Occasionally, that weird uh, uh, video turns out to be something that gets a, a good viewership. And I get lucky with that. And occasionally, it turns into something like this robotic project that hardly got any viewership. But... Uh, that's pretty much all the experience I have. I've only made uh, maybe 20 videos if I had to guess. So um, that's all I got. Uh, there's a lesson to be learned in Ross's, uh, Ross's pursuit on YouTube. The one is uh, deep niche. 
he has his channel is not 3d printing his channel is making something with gears uh youtube loves that thrives on that and kind of pushes that in a funnel and i'm taking several courses and they all say that you cannot be a jack of all trades and succeed on youtube uh, there's some who are doing it, but it's because they were big in some other aspect first, perhaps. Um, so what they do is um, they, um, they say that if you focus on one thing and you become the expert at that. Oh, so here, here's the guy's, uh, Sean Cannell's uh, explanation. Don't come to me. To lose weight because i'm not the thin guy don't come to me to get really big arms i mean my arms are not big don't come to me for that if you want to come to me to know how to put crown molding up around the ceiling yeah that i'm your guy so you have to define who you are and ross has done that perfectly and if you look at his subscriber count and, and subscribers the subscriber count doesn't mean that you're going to get views, right? That because somebody can subscribe and be like, okay, yeah, I recognize this person did something helped me. I'm going to hit the subscribe button. They may never watch your video again. That doesn't mean your content was bad. That just means that you solved their problem and they're done. And they may remember to come back to you. Um, the other people may want to watch your content continually, but Ross has done it to a point where it is only gears and anything with gears. Like, I was talking to Chuck about it when we were at Murph. He's like, transmission gear. Guess what? You're going to see Ross's video. Uh, planetary gear. Guess what? You're going to see Ross's video. It's going to be suggested to you. So, that's... Uh, and, and by the way, in a chat, uh, the Steph is my son. He makes... Um, the uh, And my son is talking to me. He's like, he's been telling me uh, to uh, to niche down and and really focus on what I'm doing instead of being this dude who's doing everything on my channel. Uh, but Johnny, uh, the Steph, he uh, he makes music, and uh, if you want to use his music, uh, you can just make sure you give him credit. It's on uh, SoundCloud, SoundCloud.com slash the Steph D I S T E F F. Uh, go ahead, uh, Glenn and Xander. Uh, tell me your approach. Tell us your approach to content creation. Oh, you want to you want to go ahead and tell them how we do? No, content? you can go ahead. You, you don't want to explain it? No, I'm no, busy. No, because Xander doesn't do any of it. It's all no, bad. No, I'm busy. Um, I you know, admittedly, my content creation uh, process Sucks. is uh, is still being massaged. Um, pretty much the way it happens is I say, oh, I should really do a video about blah, blah, blah. And then I never get around to it or, uh, or I forget, but, um, I don't, I don't necessarily like if I, if I say to myself, okay, I need to do a, a video about, uh, well, like I updated my ANA A8 to Marlin firmware today and, uh, I didn't have any idea how to do it. So I, I researched it and figured it out. And I couldn't find a good, and there probably is one out there, but I couldn't find a good step-by-step -step video to do it. So technically, I should have filmed it when I did it, but I wanted to know how to do it first. So now I'll make a video about doing it. And there's a lot of times, um, we'll talk about Taser Face back here, which is the ANET E12. Um, don't buy one. Um, that's just a little tidbit of the uh, review that's coming. But um, I, I broke the fan. It was my own fault. I broke the fan. So I had to put a new fan in it. And I needed to get the fan in it so that I could get printing. And I didn't really have time to film. So I just like, I turned the camera on and I filmed myself doing the, the fan replacement. So now what I'll do is I'll go back and shoot an intro and an outro to that video. And just voice over the section of me actually replacing the fan. Like as I was doing it, I was in my head talking through it. So, so that's one technique that I use if I need to get something done quickly. But things like um, like Xander's thing Thursdays, um, 
it's no big secret. We film those on Saturday mornings. And uh, <laughs> we usually film a couple because sometimes there's weeks where there's just not time to do it. You know, like we're at a maker fair or we're just out of town or, you know, we were out for Murph, you know, and now Earth. Um, so we film a couple of them on Saturday mornings and really the only plea, plea planning, the only pre-planning that comes with that is, uh, is picking the items. Mm -hmm. So Xander will pick the items and we'll get the, the prints printed through the week so that they're ready on Saturday mornings. And then there's no script. We don't write a script. Uh, there was a time that he used to read off of a prompter. Those days are gone. Uh, Long, gone. so, so now the videos are shot in. I, I, you know, minute or, you know, 30 seconds to a minute pieces. And then dad works the magic and makes him look good on camera. No, I already look good. <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting for that. So, but, um, so, I mean, there's times when, when I've released, in fact, there's going to be a video coming out not too long from now related to that, to that E12, that part of that video was shot in the old studio area. So like through the progress of a 10 minute video, it was over months of time and, and it's going to start in one studio area and end in the other studio area. And there's really nothing I can do about it, but. Reshoot the beginning. No, sometimes, sometimes content, you know, uh, people don't realize a 10 minute video took you a month to shoot it, you know, because things have to happen. So, but, um, I don't know. I know. I guess I'm just rambling. So, but uh, rambling. I mean, that's kind of like, I don't have a, like, I don't have a book or a, a list. Like I should have of stuff that needs to get done. Um, I just kind of go all of a sudden I say to Xander, Hey, I mean, we, we shot mailbag Monday tonight before the stream, which we usually shoot that on Saturdays as well, but I wanted him to have more free time tomorrow. So I said, Hey, let's just, let's just shoot it before we go on stream. So it was shot, and that'll be available on Monday. I so, failed so many times at this. So I hope that kind of answers the part question. Evil. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, thanks for your insight. I don't know. I I've never done this before. I, you know, like I've never done this live stream. No, I've never. Uh, I mean, I've been, never been a YouTuber before, and and I only have the success that I have because of Joel. Um, I don't know where I would be today if it wasn't for him. Um, we were at three forty-seven when the Joel effect took place. So today we'd probably be at 352. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't really know. I mean, I'm just kind of doing this by the seat of my pants. Um, I like the people that like us. I guess that's really all that you need. So I don't know if we'll ever be big YouTubers or not, but probably we're just going to keep pushing on doing what we want to do. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's some good points there. Um, the, the courses that I'm taking... One is from Sean Cannell, and he's in a section right now that he says is not glamorous, the section that I'm in. And I'm having a really tough time pushing through it. And I was in a, a private group chat with him uh, on his uh, Facebook page, and he basically said, look, watch all the content through. Just watch it. Don't even try to process it. Then go back through it and watch it a second time later when you're ready. So that's what I'm going to do. And part of the research video, I think, gets to what Ross was talking about. What, say it again, how you approach your videos. You research them somehow, Ross? I, I'm not. I, I'm going to try to drill down on what you're actually referring to. Um, how you come uh, up with the ideas for your videos. Oh, uh, well, I think for a viral video that I just want to get like a lot of views on or make a lot of revenue from, uh, I'll come up with a just a very bland idea and then try to come up with something that would make a really good thumbnail for that video and a really good title and then create the video based off of that. So you could be true to the thumbnail and title and, and not be like clickbait, but to try to create a really cool video that will also get a lot of views that people will actually click on is, is a good concept that I've, that I've been going for, I guess. Exactly what you just said is exactly what Sean Cannell is saying in this section. Oh, interesting. Because I thought I came up with that concept, but maybe not. Yeah. No, so, <laughs> so, oh, that's so, twice but, now somebody stole something from you, Ross. <laughs> yeah. All right. Woo. Uh, so, I, but, but Ross, I mean, it's it's credit to you because you you discovered what it is that's working for you. And and, and I'm sure and that's I what all the big YouTubers say that we have to do. 
So, I mean, you're big. I consider you big. You, I mean, you're 43,000 subs. You're not, yeah. you're not chump chains. So, yeah. and, and I don't mean that in disrespect at any point. It's just that, you know, you're at a level that is like, holy crap, how did he get there? So we need to look at that. I just put best in your title. That's what Tony's saying. Um, we, we need to look at that and, and try to replicate that. Now, another uh, content creator who is one who helps other YouTubers is Roberto Blake. Roberto Blake has, in every live stream I'm in, he goes, he'll have a rant every like week or every two weeks where he'll just go on a rant. And it's always ranting against the community who are cl- crying that their channel's not getting views, they're not getting this. He just says, look, if you want to get big, make a top five video, the top five things of whatever it is that's in your niche, in your section of your channel, and you'll you'll blow up because everybody wants to watch a top 10. Everybody wants to watch a top five. And if you don't think I'm, if you don't think that statement's correct, go look at the videos that are out there. No, that's, that's absolutely true, John, because I mean, when you want to go buy something, regardless of what it is, you know, you want to go buy a new power tool or a toaster or a microwave, what do you, what do you, what do you get on Google and search for? Best microwave of 2018 or whatever. People, people want that. They want somebody else to do the homework to tell them what the best one to go buy. Wait, and I, I'm guilty of that as well. I mean, the toilets in my home are based on a top 100 toilets that will flush the most poop. And that's not a joke. I mean, I bought them because they would flush a thousand grams of feces and, and only, only Zach has ever been able to clog them. (laughs) (laughs) I'm actually quite against the idea of of a top five video, but not in the aspect that you were actually talking about it. When you mentioned top five videos, I started thinking of these videos that are top five scariest sea monsters or, Top five craziest moments in Harry Potter, stuff like that. Like to me, I, I would never click on one of those videos. But if someone made a video that was uh, top five best settings to change in Marlin, I would actually watch that. I could, I would definitely see me clicking on that. Or uh, yeah. I guess something that I'm interested in. Maybe that's just what I'm getting to. Uh, right. So, so yeah. But there, but there's thousands of people, sometimes millions of people, who are interested in the top five of something, because I. I was just astounded. I just did a search on top 10. I didn't put anything else after it. And these, there's videos up there that have 100 million views, you know, of like top, top 10, top five. And it goes everything from top five boating disasters to top five plane crashes to the top five things you need to buy for, like Glenn was saying, your toilet plunger or something. You know, it's like... <laughs> But, but let me let me ask you this, John. If if you were to release a top top five video of whatever top five toasters, would the amount of I guess backlash outweigh the positivities of it? I mean, I, you know, I mean, I think we've all watched MythBusters, and there was always a, a good group in the MythBusters Facebook page and stuff of people discussing it. But the amount of fight, you know, like if I said, all right, these are the top five toasters, you better, you better be able to back that up or the amount of backlash that you will get off of that. But guess what that backlash is? Oh, I know it's, 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 it's engagement. engagement. It's, the th- right. it's the thumbs up, the thumbs down that that's just like, Hey, this it it could push you towards the trending topic. Yeah, but it, it would also it could put a, a negativity on your reputation. I'm very, very careful. It's, it's, as long as it's so the idea is that I wouldn't I wouldn't just do a top five video for like so you use the example toasters. Like that that's not me. I would do a top five something of what I'm using. Like these are the top I'm a woodworker. Top five woodworking tools you gotta have. Like, right, I would say, okay, you need but there's gonna top be, five construction tools but you need. For every thousand people that are like, yeah, there's going to be at least 100 people going, oh, you should have included a chisel and you didn't have a chisel. But that's there. great. So, but, so the thing with that is just as long as you take in, you have empathy towards those people that are like going against you, you can, you can 
say, okay, you know what? Maybe I should make another video and consider that and make a follow-up video. Top that'll, six video. That'll, <laughs> maybe. Maybe you do that. But, yeah, I mean, it, it could be what you end up doing. Yeah, if you want to – Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, the simplest video I think you can make to get a lot of views is actually uh, one that I just posted in the comments. Uh, if you click on it, it's a blank white screen for 10 hours. Me and my friends discovered this when we were playing poker in my living room and needed some light. It's got 1.7 million views, and it's not the only one. So there's an idea to oh get a lot of views. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'd ever want to be that gimmicky, though. You know, like, I don't know. I'm just going to I'm just gonna keep on doing what I'm doing because it works for me. You know, not that I don't want to be big. But, you know, after seeing Joel at Murph, I don't think I want to be Joel big. Like, that, he just doesn't get a break. It's just, like, constant. You know, I, I love my little group of, of, of friends of the channel, yeah, you know? You, you'd be surprised. You, you, will, you will do well. You have great charisma. You, you yeah, crack you jokes. Know, I mean, people like you. you at some point, he's going to get big and won't be fun anymore. But... But now Zach is getting his own YouTube channel. I don't know if, if you know this yet. No. We are going to give Zach his own YouTube channel. Zach has um, – oh, I don't know how to say this without you? being – I don't know how to say this without being offensive, but we thought Zach was special, like slow special. And, and so he does have dyslexia, and he was struggling in, in school – and we went and talked to the teacher and they tested him to see, and he's actually three points shy of being a genius. And so, you know, it's like, what? So, but the problem is, is like one part of his brain doesn't talk to the other part of his brain internally. He does it outside and everything has to be a story. If he's going to turn the light off, he has to have a toy and the toy has to turn the light off because he has to process it different. So he tells these just amazing stories. And so we were going to do a segment on Fun King where, uh, where we printed him some toys and just gave them to him and let him talk with the toys. And I ran a test, and he went for 45 minutes talking about these toys. And, uh, and I finally decided that it wasn't a good fit for Fun King, so we're going to start him his own Zactacular channel. And, you know, because when kids watch YouTube videos, they don't skip the ads. They don't turn it off. They'll let it play and walk away from it. And so it just plays and plays and plays and plays. So, you know, I want him to be on kid YouTube and, and just, you know, play with toys and whatever. Those toy unboxing videos have millions of views and I won't have to do any editing. And cause he's not going to say anything that he shouldn't. He's, I'm just going to turn him loose. So, but, and, uh, and you have to link the uh, affiliate links. Right, right. So, so that'll be that'll be some. So so that's the other aspect of it. So let's talk about that. You can do videos where you promote a product and you attach your affiliate links to it, and you can make uh, significant money with it. So I'm I'm doing pretty well with affiliate links, and I appreciate everybody who has uh, purchased something. So if if you haven't uh, donated any money uh, for whatever reason. Uh, maybe because it's I'm fat, um, or uh, you know, you put, did, you, did you just say because you're fat? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe it's because I'm fat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's why I haven't donated any money. Yeah, thanks. So, um, so, but what you could do is you could support it in a different way, and if you, if you. Uh, if there's a product that you want to get, you know, you, you click on the link and uh, make your purchase, and then I get a, a commercial. <laughs> so, yeah, Tony's like, jeez. <laughs> uh, don't know that they're donated money. Yeah. So, yeah t Tony just asked if I had the right kid tested. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, Uncle Ron story. wants to know the estimated launch for Zach. I don't know. I want to have about twelve to fifteen videos, and then and then we'll launch the channel. So. But so I, I do want to say something about the affiliate links. There's there are people in the world who think that we only do this for for the money, um, which maybe some people do. I don't. Um, I do this because well, I do this because it gives Xander and I 
something to bond. Um, as he started to get older, we kind of didn't have anything in common anymore. And the whole YouTube thing has brought us back together, which is really cool. Um, but I do like money and money does help the channel. Um, there, I don't know. Some people have it locked in their brain that affiliate links cost them because they click on an affiliate link and the channel gets something out of it that it costs them more. And that is a hundred percent not true. Um, if you're going to buy an item and you buy it through an affiliate link, it costs you exactly the same with or without that affiliate link. And the channel gets some, and you can even, if it's an Amazon, if it's an Amazon affiliate link, you can take it one step further and click the affiliate link, then go to smile.amazon and you will help your charity and you'll help the channel. So it's a little double dipping in there. So I just wanted to clear that up because. Wait, so, so uh, tell me about smile again and how, okay. how it works both ways. Well, smile.amazon.com. You can, you go to smile and you set up what charity you want to give to. I give to St. Jude's children's hospital. Um, so everything that I buy from Amazon, a little piece of that, I mean, I, I, it always says like, this is eligible for smile. This is, I don't know. I've never run into one that wasn't eligible, but a little percentage of it goes to your charity that you've chosen. Well, if, uh, so I want to buy something. So I click on your link, John, I click on your affiliate link. So now that affiliate link is associated with my account, but I go over to smile.amazon instead, and then I buy it. St. Jude still gets a little cut of that and you get the little cut of it for your, for your affiliate link. Oh, so, okay. so it, it, you can kind of double dip giving the money out. I mean, it doesn't double dip to the channel. It goes to St. Jude. What are you doing there? He's got something moving and he's excited. Neat, neat gearing. I, I like those gears there, Xander. Yeah. So, but uh, some very yeah, nice gears that you got. I, I, I don't know if I should bring this up, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I have a, I have a fan of the channel who called me out in, in the comments of my mailbag Monday. Oh, I um, know what you're talking about. First calling me a mooch um, because people send me things and I don't give them away to needy children, as it was put. Um, this person actually may be, may be watching right now. I don't know. I mentioned this in, in, uh, Walter's stream the other morning and he, he then called me out on the fact that I called him out on it. Um, but you know, I, I get things from, from friends of the channel and then this guy is upset that I'm not giving it away. And I, I'm just, I'm, I, I don't know. It just seems kind of weird. And and I, it, won I wonder if he said anything to Joel. I don't know. It just seemed like um, the, the people who aren't content creators get a little bit jealous because the content creators get things. And the coolest part about being a content creator is anybody can do it. Anybody can be a content creator. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do for a living. You can be on YouTube too. You don't have to apply Yay! for it. You don't have to go through an interview. You can just do it. So you're telling me I could have a YouTube channel? No, you're underage. Darn it. So those people out there who are jealous of the content creators, join us. Do it. So, and I, and I warned the guy, I said, you know, cause he said, well, maybe I should start a YouTube channel and, uh, and get free stuff too. And I'm like, heck yeah. And if you want, I'll give you some tips on how to get started. But I said, be forewarned, it takes a lot of time and it takes money. I mean, it takes money to do it right. And, and I mean, he fired back something about his brother or cousin or neighbor's dog's owner's best friend or whatever does it and shoots them all off of cell phone, which is absolutely can be done. But I, I suppose it depends on the type of video you're doing. So um, that's actually how I do all of my videos is by cell phone and Chuck, Chuck does them all on iPad, right? Yeah. I mean, it can definitely be done. I'm, I'm surrounded by a couple thousand dollars worth of hardware here, but you know, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, I just want everything to be just right. You know, the lighting just right and the sound just right. Yeah. So let's but, talk about that. So I think I'm, I'm dropped, super jealous. <laughs> I dropped like 4,000 on my computer, 4,500. I dropped, uh, you know, probably twelve hundred on the camera rig. 
on top of my GoPro. I got the Yeti microphone here so you can hear me with quality sound. Doesn't this sound sexy? You know, I mean, it, well, I and you the, know, the whole good microphone setup. Have you ever noticed, John, that if you go and you watch a YouTube video that maybe the video is not so great, but the sound is clear, you will watch it all the way through. But if there is anything wrong with the sound, even if it was 4K video, if there's anything wrong with the sound, you're like, Psh, I'm going to go find another video. Right. So yeah. Audio is important. Yeah. So I don't know if you know Basic Filmmaker. Uh, he He's a content creator who helps YouTubers um, make better content by understanding how to set up lighting, what camera rig to use, how to set up color correction and things like that. And uh, one of his points was, you got to have good audio. And John Mack just said it, exactly what you said, Glenn. You know, audio is key. Have good audio. So that's why I got the Yeti here, because before, there's a couple of videos, and I'd like to show them in some other live stream, where I used this headset with the microphone here to record, and the audio was horrible. But then there's some tricks that you can play with it in the Adobe. I love the Adobe collection. And I use Adobe Audition and the basic filmmaker, basic filmmaker episode 98. He talks about audition filters and he set up some amazing filters where he adds compression, some parametric filters, some noise uh, cancellation or noise filtering. And it, it makes it sound like you're in a radio studio. Uh, some some awesome stuff you can do with post processing of audio if you really want to make a quality video. Yeah, well, and you know, like sometimes you buy equipment and then you realize it wasn't right. I mean, we started with the big boom microphones, you know, on the arm, and they had good sound, but it was always something, you know, in the face, and you had to worry about moving it for camera angles and stuff. And we went to these, and these are these are cheap. These are made by Fafine. They come off of it's off Fafine. of Amazon. I think they're like thirty bucks a piece. Wireless. Each battery is like crazy. I'd love to get a link to those. Um, I, I, I I'll dig something up. I'll dig something up and put it in the chat. Um, but I mean, there's a little bit of a not a buzz, but a little bit of a almost a hiss or a little noise behind them compared to the other mics, but it's so nice to be wireless and to be able to move around. And, and so we've, we've done three of these, but I also run through a mixer and that's something that most content creators don't have to have because they're just recording, but we're recording two different people and I'm definitely more dynamic than, than Xander is. So Xander has to have a little bit more boost than I do, you know? And so being that we had the two channels, we had to go to a mixer. So there's there's a lot of little things to to do it right that that adds cost adds cost adds cost and one day I would like to have a real camera instead of instead of webcams and mainly being that I have two 920s that conflict with each other all the time which is annoying but you know and then lighting and there's just stuff that <laughs> it just adds up so everybody everybody yeah. can be a content creator I looked at my credit card like I was just doing blind purchases of stuff, stuff that I thought I needed. Yeah, I think I think ninety percent of it I did, and uh, it was just ridiculous the amount that I racked up. You just don't pay attention to it when you're trying to build up the platform. Well, and, and then there's there's not even not even just the the content creation stuff, but also you know having to buy materials to do projects. It, you know, I mean, just I mean from the three D printing aspect having to buy filament or having to buy, you know, electronic projects or whatever, you know, and, and I know that a lot of people will say, well, you know, you're the one doing the channel you should, but, but if you're giving to the community, it's cool that the community gives back. And, and I'm not, I'm not saying that the community should hundred percent support us. I mean, again, I mean, it's not my job. I have a job job, but I love, I love, um, I don't, I don't want to give it away. Monday's mailbag Monday this week was really awesome because it was it was all stuff that people had made and that's that's what I love. I love when people send me the stuff that they've printed and the stuff that they've poured their heart into. I mean, I love getting stuff like uh like, you know, Uncle Ron Uncle Ron throws me this 
it's a it's a you know a, a generic GoPro, but I didn't have one of those, and now I do because of of Ron brew it, print it, bake it, shake it, make it, fake it, unload it, oven it. Yeah, <laughs> I can never remember his actual user, but uh, no, I mean, I, I getting stuff in the mail from from from. I don't want one. I don't like the term fans. Friends of the channel. It it it's like a bond. It's it's uh, it's very personal. It's very cool. I would love to show you like this really cool thing that we got this week, but you'll have to wait till Monday to see it. But it was made special for us. Um, um, I, Mike Mike's probably still in the chat somewhere, but he uh, owns a sign shop and made me an eight foot long Fun King banner. Just, just made me one. Like, didn't say, "Hey, do you want a banner?" Or, "Hey, I can make you a banner." Made the banner, boxed it up, and shipped it to me. And and it's it's awesome. It's not I didn't that know he, I didn't I didn't know he did that. Oh yeah, yeah. It's um. Oh, I would have I would have went through him instead of going through the other place I went through. See if I can. Uh, it's uh, open signs. I'm gonna hold this up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you see that? Is it too glary? Uh, slightly, yeah. Well, he has to post a link in there. It's, uh, it's open signs. Um, it doesn't have his web address on here, but it's, uh, area code seven, two, four, five, eight, eight, zero, seven, one, zero. And just, I mean, it's, I'm not going to unroll the whole thing cause it's huge, but it just blew me away. I, I love, it's like a mystery, a mystery every week. So no, yeah, that's so good if stuff. It makes me, if it makes me a beggar or a mooch, so be it. Please keep sending me all this cool stuff. I love the stuff you guys said. Yeah, right. No, it's uh, the thing I appreciate is everyone just coming into the live stream. They come into the live stream or commenting on the video. I'm nobody. I'm I'm a content creator. I'm I'm the same as everybody else. We're all making stuff. We're all in this together. The fact that they spend the time to to view my how how is it that I'm getting or I should say we're getting uh, minutes hundreds of minutes of watch time from the community you know and then you got people like Chris Riley I mean look at all the people that are in in his live streams and and water is doing these daily live streams you know, water is gonna be pretty soon he's gonna be dead on water is gonna be uh, the 4,000 hours soon I estimate based on what he was talking about today, he might make that in six or seven months. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Because he does a lot of the live stream. Live streams are where it's at. Uh, yeah. We it's did we did uh, the live stream last Sunday with my friend Grant, um, who uh, he's he's my coworker, and he was I could tell he was interested in three D printing, but didn't really know how to take the plunge. So you know, we brought him over, and then we blindsided him and gave him a printer. Um, we gave him that MP select mini that, that I had won in a contest and, and I gave him the first print off of it and a, yeah, and a roll of filament and send him on his way to go learn about 3d printing. But that, that live stream was three hours and we got 103 hours of watch time Go my young one. in three hours. You just, you, to get that out of a regular video is 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 it just takes forever you know i haven't had like a, a hundred thousand watch video or you know like i don't think i've had a thousand viewed video yet so i mean no. my stuff's just not that cool but well, uh mine is. but it will be there's stuff coming there will be um <laughs> no you, you know what you you keep producing keep doing your thing and this is advice for everybody eventually you're going to find the thing that really resonates that's the thing you got to repeat and just keep doing it. And at some point it'll dry up. You have to be ready to pivot to the next thing. And that's what all the big YouTubers are saying. You got like, look at Phil, Phil DeFranco. He's faced with a dilemma right now. He has a very successful news channel on YouTube. Did he start out doing drums? I, I don't remember, but, but now his, his channel is being suppressed by YouTube and his views are literally down 300 to 400,000 a video, which that is a significant amount of money Yeah, uh, that's being lost. So he's diversifying. He's 
pulling together his DeFranco army and they are uh, looking elsewhere for setting up shop so that he can continue this without being suppressed. And it, it can happen to any one of us. I mean, we can talk about 3D printing and all of a sudden 3D uh, printing is... Absolutely. Well, you could say just one wrong thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and I don't, I don't like to censor myself. I mean, I don't, I won't really say I'm more careful on camera. I mean, I'm genuine. I am who I am. I, I am on camera who I am in real life. Um, but once in a while, and you know, I'm a very joking person. I love to make people laugh and I love to, you know, goof around. And there's been times when I've said things that could be definitely taken wrong. So I guess that part of it, I am a little bit more careful than never because I had to hate to kill my whole entire YouTube channel over one stupid joke or one. Well, I'm slowly killing my channel by doing 3d printing content. You're killing your channel by doing 3d printing content. Yep. I use this program or this website morning fame and it shows you if things are helping your channel grow or not. And every time I post a 3d printed related video, it's, it's losing, but I got to say it could be because it's only the live streams. I don't have many videos. So the live streams themselves, like this live stream is going to kick ass. Like I'll look at morning fame 24 hours from now and it's going to do very well because I have 19 people watching right now. There's a lot of comments and the comments are what really drive the engagement up. That's a signal to YouTube that, Hey, you know, this is something important that's going on on this channel. Um, but my other videos where, you know, we have important members of the community that are there, core members of my channel who are participate. Um, but other people will see that video and I see numbers like negative three subscribers on that video. So it's a signal to me that I need to distill that information and turn it into a video. But, but, do you think that it's like based just on, on average? Okay. Cause you had a channel that was, was, you know, un, unrelated. I mean, it's not, but it is. And, and that's where you built your initial following. Yep. <clears throat> then you introduce something, something new to it, which is a definitely a smaller market. There, there's no doubt that the 3d printing is, is a, is a yep. niche market as it is. But so do you think it's based on average because because all these people were here for this and only this many people are here for this. I mean, is it Preston's running into that now? He, he posts the, you know, he's primarily eboards and then he posts this stuff about 3d printing and he's losing subs from it. Uh, so it's the same, it's the same thing. People are there for eboards, but I take the approach that I'm an engineer and I'm a maker and I like to do things. The big YouTubers are telling me, you got to niche down and it's what Ross is doing. Ross has that down. He is the guy for niching down and eventually he'll get to the point where he's so big that he can do the vlogs. He can do uh, cooking with Ross on his channel and people will love it. You know, he's not there yet. Well, as long as he doesn't get to the point where he starts visiting, you know, like, the grave forest of Japan and all that, about that, because that'll demonetize my video. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mention any names. I didn't say yeah. any names. Yeah. So, but, the, but, but that's the know. point. So he's got the niche and he's down and I'm right. introducing this new content. That's irrelevant. But, but okay. So let's, let's, let's talk about just 3d printing. Um, you know, and, and again, because yours was built on something else. Our channel wasn't, our channel was only ever built on 3D printing with, you know, a few electronic projects. So is that already niche down enough? Yeah, or, you're good. You're good. Or, or you, you have to keep I, going. I'm not even talking about me. I'm just using me as an example because sure. that's all we do. You know, we don't really do anything outside of that. No. But, but Or do you have to drill down even further? You know, do you have to be the guy that just does, you know, best printer ever reviews or, or, you know, or only does, you know, different, different reviews on filament or, you know, like how, how, 
how far do you have to drill down for it to be enough? Uh, again, I use Ross. He's only gearing. I think this whole subject of 3D printers, I think that that's drilled down far enough. So you could look at uh, Cartesian, Delta, Core XY, like uh, 3D printed stuff. And I think that's a pretty narrow category all in itself. Yeah, so you're you're there. You're there, Glenn. You just yeah, got to keep producing I content. Don't, I don't, like, I don't want to drill down any further than I already have. You know, like, I like to cover everything in the 3D printing world and um, and still throw an electronic project in there because I think that those two kind of go together. You know, the, the fact that you can, it, it you know, shows, wrap uh, stuff. It shows how you can create your, what, what was your switcher thing for OBS? The hot box. Yeah, it shows how you can create that. Yeah, show that to us. Yeah, that's uh, that's my crowning jewel. And the new one that's coming is is sleeker and smaller and and better. And you know, when I get around to it, <laughs> uh, I just don't have any time. We got a question here, Ross from Hack Hack Monkey. Uh, how much of your content is monetized? I would hope all of it is. All of it. Yeah, all of my uh, all of my content is monetized. Yeah, I mean, once you once you get to the point where you can monetize stuff, I mean, unless you're going against something that you know something that YouTube state, I mean, don't ever not monetize, unless it's something that would be, I don't know, even even the giveaways, even giveaways you can you can monetize now. Um, Joel just did a video, and I can't even remember what it what it was, but he actually stated in the video, this video is not monetized, blah, 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 blah. And I can't remember why I'm starting to get foggy. It's it's, it's late. Was it the CR 10 one? No, no, no. It was something that he just released recently. But sometimes you can oh. get in trouble with giveaways for monetizing it and becoming like a gambling uh, law problem. I thought maybe, oh, that could be. But, but you're not technically paying to enter. So I don't know. I looked into it, and there there was nothing against it. But it was uh, Joel's video about giving the money for the uh, selfies. The uh, the um, the oh sweeties, yeah yeah the, the when it was matching or whatever. Yeah, the the selfies with Dave. So and he and he stated that he didn't monetize that, and like I I didn't understand why, but I didn't I didn't question it. I mean, Joel's a busy guy. And uh, so a skewed view uh, had a point. We will never monetize. So this is something that uh, Roberto Blake says that the, the amount of money that you make on monetized videos is tiny compared to the benefit of becoming an a influencer. So if you... He said, everybody should turn off monetizing your videos. Because let's say you were invited to go to Good Morning America. So for those not in the U.S., we have a TV show um, that's uh, televised on one of our networks called Good Morning America. And it's like in the morning, 7 to 9 or something. And they'll sometimes have people on there. If you had the opportunity to go on Good Morning America for whatever reason, would you do it? Sure. Uh, if you had a reason to do it, to pitch a product, yeah. This platform is free. So his point is you have, you can reach millions of people if you do things right on YouTube. It should be free. And then if you couple that with as you get your footing on YouTube, you get better at doing that, you could offer courses, you could offer training material, you can offer... Uh, products that you sell, which you should make products and sell, which I don't yet. Um, there's so many things that you can, you can offer affiliate links. There's there's ways to, to make money without having to monetize your videos. So uh, what Sloan was saying there is, is right. You don't have to monetize, but I, can, I couldn't I couldn't survive. I couldn't survive without that nineteen dollars a month that you do. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. So. For me, you know, it's a significant amount of money that's coming in. It's to the point where I'm considered it's considered a second job for me uh, on my channel, and that's why I'm pouring more, more money into it because I see the long game. This is for me. I'm two and a half years in a five year plan. 
and then I'll readjust along the way if there's problems. So yeah, I value that opinion there, uh, Shalom. Uh, I gotta get out of here, guys. Uh, yeah, it's late. We should probably uh, call it quits. Um, you guys don't have else... to leave just because I am. <laughs> uh, it's it's late. It's it, typically we end at one o'clock. Don't let me say that. It's late. Xander's still cranking along, but we have video to shoot in the morning. So sure. Yeah. So I'd say uh, let's do our outros. So uh, you can go ahead first, Ross. All right. Uh, I'm Ross, and this was uh, You Do It and Geared On For What, streaming live. Uh, you can check out my channel by clicking on my name. And, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks for uh, being a uh, guest host, a surprise guest host. I kept that under wraps. The only one who knew was Chuck, uh, that you were joining us. Uh, okay. So I'm excited that you're here. Uh we, we need you to form formally introduce you to the system. So I have to invite you via Facebook. Um, so DM me your uh, Facebook name. And uh, I'm Rigor on Offensive on Facebook. It's my middle name and my last name backwards. Roger to Stefano. It's Rigor on Offensive. And I have a short green bus as my icon. And that is because they thought I was special when I was in kindergarten. They sent me off to a special school for one year. Um, okay. So anyway, that, I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll DM you my Facebook profile. Yep. Good. And I'll, I'll set it, I'll add a friend request and then we can invite you into the, uh, F3 PCH streamers. All right. Uh, Glenn and Xander. R Ross, first of all, I got to say that, uh, I'm almost a little embarrassed. That I didn't even know who you were. Um, like when you posted in the chat and I went to your channel and see how many followers you had, I was like, well, no. So, um, but, uh, I don't know if you're on Twitter. If you are, please, uh, please find me at fun King 3d and, uh, and follow you'll, you'll, me so that we can stay. Is, but he's going to yeah. meet you right away, Ross. I'll do that right on right now. I mean, meet me right away. What do you mean? <laughs> it's just a fun joke that I have between me and Glenn. He, he said that as soon as he followed me, that he immediately muted me. And it's even on one of my videos. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like, he followed me, I followed him back, and then I put him on mute. Cause I, you know, Which I can't means anything that. I post, he can't say. Yeah. I can't handle that. I'm going to have to check. I don't think I really did that. but You know what's funny is you've actually got way more Twitter followers than I do. I, I followed you on Twitter. That's because I, uh, I give stuff away. <laughs> and one of the things was, you know, we had a contest, and one of the things was I, you know, I had him follow me on Twitter. It's, it's the reason I did that is because I'm really bad about following people on Twitter. So it, it gave me like a list of people to follow on Twitter. So, cause I like, I, my Twitter is only 3d printing people. I came to Twitter to get away from the negativity and the, the politics that was on Facebook. And uh, so I very carefully surrounded myself with, with positive people and anybody that I followed, if they start posting negative or political, I, uh, I mute them. So, so keep that in mind, Ross. If you want to stay friends, buddy, you got. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm apolitical anymore. Like I used to do stuff on Facebook, and I'm like, you know what? I, I just can't. I can't do it anymore. It's too toxic, and so it. I, just, I, got very I stopped. Stuck into it during the elections, and uh, it was it was destroying my life, and I just didn't like it. And then, uh, and then 3D printing saved me. So, but yeah, so it was absolutely a pleasure to meet you, Ross. I, I'm. Uh, I'm glad that you came into this stream and we had the, the opportunity to learn who you are. And uh, I don't know, at some point, I'm sure that, uh, I don't know, our paths will cross or we'll have a reason to do a collaboration. Oh, you're coming to Earth, right, uh, Rose? No, I, I'm not going to make it to Earth. You said that was in Maryland? Yeah, you're coming, to, you're coming to Earth, right, Ross? I, I'm from Minnesota. Uh, that's like way further away than... I was actually going to guess that. What part of Minnesota are you from? I'm from northern Minnesota, kind of by like Canada, not uh, probably two hours from yeah, Canada. You do have a little bit of a Canadian accent, but I'm hey? from Minnesota. I was born in St. Louis Park, down around you know the Twin Cities. So, okay. and certain things that you say, you know, like the way you <laughs> pronounce things, I'm like, God, that just sounds like Minnesota. So, yeah, uh, yes. it, it, I'm really glad that we had a chance to meet Ross, and so. I, I think that we'll do some collabs and I can help with the robotic stuff and the kinematics. So I have to re-remember a lot of stuff that I forgot. Uh, but uh, it'll be a fun challenge. 
Uh, I want to thank everyone who participated in this live stream. I really appreciate your time. Uh, the the donations are just I'm floored by the generosity. Uh, just willing to, to first off, willing to give up your time uh, to sit here and listen to us banner back and forth ideas and talk about stuff. Uh, thank you, Ken, for sending me that email. Um, I I really appreciate the the time. I appreciate the donations, uh, the kind words that you guys send, the encouragement. You know, uh, we're I think pretty much all of us are content creators who are participating right now in this F3D PCH, uh, whether you post a photo on Instagram or tweet something. I mean, that's a form of content creation, sharing ideas. Um, we continue that and, you know, we can help guide each other to what the next thing is going to be. Uh, I have a lot of projects on my plate that I want to finish. And I have a lot of videos that I have yet to edit that I don't have up on my channel. And there's a lot of things that we can do to help each other grow by merely supporting each other. We are, in a sense, gaming the system. We are supporting each other uh, to get through these uh, challenging times on YouTube. Absolutely. And the more collaborations we can do and the more we can help yeah. out. And, and, you know, even given the different channel shout outs during your live streams has helped significantly uh, Rover with the under 1000 subscriber list has helped tremendously. I mean, we've watched so many little channels grow up and uh, yeah, it's, it's been awesome. And, and uncle Ron in the chat is telling me that I actually met Ross at Merv. You did. Yeah, you uh, did. He said that. I think I have video proof of that. Don't feel voice. bad because I don't remember either. So. Oh, I'm, I'm. You don't I'm, remember being yourself? Fa faces I'm good <laughs> with, names I'm generally not good with, but that whole weekend was just a huge blur anyway. So, but uh, yeah. Uncle Ron was kind of my handler for the weekend. So, if he says I met you, I guess I met you. <laughs> no, Ron, Ron was big. big <laughs> well, let me tell you, let me tell you what. We were standing like right in front of your table, John, and there was a there was a crowd like towards uh, see me CNC, like going that way, and uh, and I was kind of walking, and and Ron turns around and looks me in the face and says, "Do you want me to move the crowd?" And <laughs> and I kind of like it took me aback for a minute, and I'm like, "No," <laughs> you know, like, and now I'm almost sorry I didn't say yes because I would like to have seen how that went down. Could you people get out of the way? Fun King is coming through. Yeah, he would have said something like, make a hole. <laughs> you know, in the military. So. I'm not even sure how that would have went down, but it would have been awesome. Eat the face. Yeah, so I appreciate everybody's insight. Uh, one of the things I'm learning is how to be empathetic towards uh, the viewers. And, you know, if they have if they have something where they say something fail, you know, I'll I have to, I'll respond to them maybe, and then, you know, I'll remove them from the channel because we have that obligation to keep our content clean because YouTube can ban us if we don't, which I think is ridiculous, but they can. Um, and I look forward to interacting with everybody. I do want to have a giveaway at some point, but it's not the giveaway in the sense that you get something physical. It's a giveaway in the sense that it would be giving back to the viewers. And I want to, I want to have it where uh, there'll be two categories. One will be for under a thousand uh, subscribers, and one will be over a thousand subscribers. And uh, not that there's any difference in them, but um, the idea is that if you happen to win one or the other, uh, you'll be listed on my channel as, as somebody who, you know, your channel should be checked out. And I think that would be a fun little thing that everybody can participate in. And we may find that other channels want to do it. And it's not, it's not one where maybe you have to subscribe, but it's one where maybe you have to watch a video or something. And uh, following on Twitter is fine because there's nothing with analytics that would get messed up with that. And that's a good way of connecting with the community. Yeah. Uh, Chris, Chris Riley and I, we have a, he sent me a, a, a net, uh, E10, which he's told me is just like my E12. So I'm not looking forward to this anymore, but I told him that I would take the, the 10 and put it together and 
fix it so it was a good printer and then we were going to give it away but this whole subscribe to the channel to enter the giveaway will backfire on you so badly you definitely don't want subscribers you don't you want to just view the video right just watch the video don't subscribe if they want the only subscribers that you want are the ones who want to be there not the ones who want to be there just to just to win something and i'm just as guilty entering contests to channels i have no interest in and then later unsubscribing you know I, i'm guilty but, of it too what about this thing where uh, about 90 percent of my friends that use youtube don't log in because they're too lazy to look up their Google password. What about those people that might be interested in your content, but are literally just too lazy to log into YouTube? Do you think that could be uh, something that might benefit you? Well, yeah, I mean, okay, so so I don't know if you know the story, Ross, but uh, no, Zan Xander and I, Xander and I did a, a drive to 250 giveaway. Um, AIO Robotics sponsored it, gave us a 12 pack of filament. So we did five rolls for first place, four to second, three to third. And um, it drove us from, I don't even remember, but we went we, over we the went 250 over. mark with it. We went over 300. And then a month later, at 347 subscribers, Joel Telling released our channel as one of five to go subscribe to to get into his contest. And Overnight, from 347 at at 11 <laughs> o'clock Friday night to Saturday morning at 8 a.m., we were over 1,600. And by the end of the weekend, we were over 3,000. And we ended up at 5,500. So, and and that was 50, over two weeks. It, it was a two-week contest. And right towards the end of that two weeks, we did a 5,000 giveaway, uh, which was a printer and a bunch of filament. And uh, it was a great giveaway. And so it, it held, and then as soon as all the contests were over, we're now at just over 4,500. So we've lost 1,000 subscribers over the course of Xander making people angry and the, and, the, <laughs> and, the, and the contest people going away. So, so yes, we're still at 4,500. From, from 350 to 4,500. And we have some of the greatest channel friends that came from that contest. So, oh, which friends so the definitely channel? the contest will benefit it, but you're going to lose some. So, and then when we did our contest, we picked three channels to do it the same that Joel did. And uh, one of them was uh, Thomas from Arduino Makes, who's an 11 year old creator and uh, super smart kid. And, um, at 500 or 550, he was so excited. And I said to him, I said, listen, though, you're going to lose some of those subscribers because it's a contest subscription thing. And he said, I don't care. I have enough. So <laughs> question, so, though, are you getting views now like you would if you had 5000 subscribers? Or are you getting views like you would if you had 100 subscribers or whatever you were at? We're definitely not getting views of the 4500. I mean, like, okay, so Xander's Thing Thursday comes out on Thursday, and he's averaging between 100 and 200 views. I mean, it's not 4,500 people looking at the videos. It's not bad, so, but it's I mean, good at this. Right, time. I mean, 100 is great for him. It's, it's great. But it's um, – and it, and it varies. I have probably a core group of about between 30 and 50 people who are always at my live streams and stuff like that. Um, the ones that I consider the, not necessarily the inner circle, but the, you know, my core group, my, the friends and of my channel. The and best would be friends of the channel. About 10% of your subscriber count then, right? Um, right now I'm looking at, I think 5% of my subscriber count will pretty much show up and watch every video that I put out. So I, that's better than I'm doing actually. Well, it, it's, it's one, one, one percent. If I have 4,500 people and 45 people show up, that would be 1%. Well, I did never say I was good at math, but... <laughs> <laughs> you just designed gears. <laughs> Very well, too. Um, so uh, one, of the, one of the things that they talk about, too, is discoverability. So if you have 99% of the people who are watching your videos are not subscribers you have a really good chance of being discovered and having somebody subscribe to you. If, 
if you have 99% or subscribers who are watching your stuff, that means that nobody else is discovering you. So it's not to say anything about the quality of your videos and whether or not a subscriber is interested in your video. It has to say more with maybe this is how much Google is promoting your video. You have to find out how it's being discovered. You can find out if it's being discovered through Google search or through Google suggested. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have a feeling that like, I mean, out of the people that we have, most of them probably don't have the notifications turned on and they never came back and watched any of the videos, which I mean, it's, it's, it's okay. I don't lose sleep at night. When the, when the subscription count started to drop, it bothered me. It bothered sure. me bad. And then I realized that I don't want those people. If they, if they don't want to be there, I don't want them to be there. You know, I mean, there, there's plenty of YouTube channels out there for everybody to go watch. So, so I, I got over it. I don't lose sleep at night because, because they're not there anymore. But I would like more people to come and watch. And I know it'll happen. And I think, I think the biggest problem is because, because we blew up overnight. You know, we didn't, we didn't go through those growing pains um, or the typical growing pains. We just went from, you know, entertaining 350 people to entertaining 5,500 people overnight, which was, uh, was hard to adjust to. But, um, but it's kind of scary, isn't it? To think that you no longer know if you can entertain your audience. Because that it, happened to me. It, it was, it was very weird. In fact, that Saturday morning, that Saturday, I was supposed to hang Christmas lights. And I spent the whole day watching, uh, uh, what's that website? Social Blade. <laughs> I watched Social Blade just climb, 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 climb. So, yeah. but um, I, I don't know. Like, I just finally decided, you know, Xander was, was irritated by the drop in, in, in subscribing count too, you know, as it started to drop down. And, and, and I warned him. I said, you know, after the contest is over, it's going to start dropping. And, and it, was, it was a little bit unnerving. And then... I just thought, you know, we're just going to keep on doing what we're doing. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't. You're going to be successful doing that, Glenn. So I, mean, you're, well, I, I look at it, you're successful now. You broke a thousand subscribers. That's a, yeah, but, that's a tough ceiling to break. But I didn't, you know, like I but didn't. You did, but you did. You did. So, But, but it was a handout. We didn't, but we not, did I'm at not, the same You know, time. I'm not saying, you know, because yeah, like I said something to Joel when Joel and I were live streaming that night. I said something and Joel's like, I'm sorry. And I'm like, no, don't be. It's no, amazing. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing it's, thing. It, it is. To, but, but we're doing that. And that's what I want to kind of promote with the giveaway, that idea that I suggested where, you know, you, you, you put your name in there, you watch a video. If you win, your name is going to get, put on my video now i'm only at five thousand subs but it's not that i'm at i'm at almost two million views on my channel right so there's a chance that somebody's going to see this video if i do the seo right and everything and it might push somebody to you there's also a chance i can lose a subscriber from it because it's 3d printing related so you know yeah. it's not well it's not, it's in my video chris, stuff. chris riley and i with the whole e10 giveaway you know we didn't want to do it based on come and subscribe to the channel and then you get and and so i said well maybe if we like you go in and pick one of your videos where you said something that you didn't say in any other video or something was in the background or whatever and the people have to go like on a scavenger hunt and find that video with that item or whatever in it and then because then they're just going to go even if they watch them fast they're going to go watch every video to try to find that spot you know so, or even give them a list somewhere in these five videos. That's a better approach because they're more likely to do that. And the advantage is, is that every time they click around in that video, it, it counts as a view. And so it blows that number up. But then the other thing is, is that it's also a form of engagement because they're hunting around in the video. Right. So it's, a, it's, a, it's another one of those many millions of signals that YouTube captures that how somebody is clicking on a video. So if they're constantly going forward and backward, and not always just skipping ahead going forward. That's, that's news that, to me. Yeah, that's I, a signal for YouTube that hey, you know, there's something in this video that people want to constantly see. So I did not know that. Yeah. 
Yeah, they have, believe me, they got like 80,000 or 800,000 viewpoints that they capture. It's it's insane. All we'll right, so you guys go for tonight. Yeah, thank you, Ross. Yeah, we're going to end now. The hard stop will be in a minute. So I want to okay. thank everybody again. I'm totally humbled uh, by by the generosity of the community and the fact that everybody's sticking around. Well, you have 18 viewers here. You know, Jeffrey just joined in. It's a pleasure having everybody here. And uh, thank you, Glenn and Xander, Ross, uh, Chuck, and uh, Walter, who joined in. I appreciate you all. And uh, stay real and true. And Ross was tired of our crap. He's out. <laughs> yeah. And we'll uh, just make sure you tweet to me. If, if you have a live stream going on, there's so many tweets. Like, I, I, I'm following 1,800 people. You know, it's like I got to put them in a different list to manage that. You have to you have to get my attention by tweeting directly to me that hey I'm live streaming and I will see it and and I'll probably probably play it and help your view counts grow. So Sounds anyway, good. thank hey, you. Mom. All right, bye everyone. Wait, I'm not done. Good night. Bye everybody. <laughs> I'm not done. All right. You won't be done tonight. No, no, I'm almost done. Good I can night. feel it.